Plus, on the way in our My Pet Tale, our friend Judy Greer tells us about her great love for her dog. And then later, we're diving into some beloved shows, Sabrina the Teenage Witch and Gilmore Girls. So fans get ready. All of that is just ahead. But first, let's see what we have up on Popstar Plus. Amber Ruffin joined us for our What I Watch series, the comedian and actor who hosts her own talk show, The Amber Ruffin Show. It's very funny. Was kind enough to tell us all about the long list of shows that she cannot stop watching. What I watch when I can't fall asleep is not a good question for me. I can always fall asleep. TV cannot help me. I'm great at sleeping. If America was in the Olympics for sleeping, I would represent our country and I would bring home the gold. I'm good at sleeping. What I watch when it's late at night. I like to watch every late night show. Every late night show there's ever been, I love to watch it. I love to watch the old late night shows. I love to watch it now. Only because when I was watching it, I never thought I would have a late night show. But when you have one, you watch it, it's different. That was great. You know what else is great? Finally making this show for you all. When I was preparing for this season of The Amber Ruffin Show, I watched, um, you know, I watched some Carol Burnett. I did, I watched some Dick Cavett. I watched some of those old, like, variety show, variety shows. And it was very clear how little you needed. <laughs> There's just people goofing around. And I was like, oh, you know, what a relief. Like those cool things we remember. We're just people goofing around. And that's a torch I'm willing to carry to this day. <laughs> What do I watch? I like to, when it's late, I do like to catch up. So when I'm catching up, I'm catching up on my favorite shows. And my favorite shows are Queens. I watched every last episode in real time. And I can't just be allotting time from eight to nine at night. I still have work to do. And then Abbott Elementary. Hey, yo, what it do, baby boobs? What y'all think about this little film crew I brought in here? Distracting, makes our jobs harder. But exciting, we about to be on TV. Because they are covering underfunded, poorly managed public schools in America. No press is bad press, Barb. Look at Mel Gibson, still thriving. <laughs> Abbott Elementary is great. It is just very character driven. But I do think that Abbott Elementary found some very fun characters and leaned into them. And even though they're big characters, you haven't seen them before. You know, they found a new take on, you know, the bully and a new take on the nerd. Like, it's all so fresh. It's great. And Quinta is the best. What I watch when I need comfort food is the same thing everyone watches when they need comfort food. And that's Ted Lasso. It's the most comforting show on planet Earth. It's just as good as everybody says. But... The people who love Ted Lasso might not know that they also love Joe Para's show, Joe Para Talks With You. It is this very gentle comedian, and he just is living in, I think, Wisconsin, and, you know, being his gentle self, and, you know, whittling wood and stuff. And along those same lines, John Wilson, How To With John Wilson, is also a very comforting show where you know, not a lot happens, but it stays interesting, and then afterwards you feel a little happier. Those are the three shows. What I watch that might surprise people is, it shouldn't, but it always does, is Grey's Anatomy. Man, I've been watching Grey's Anatomy since the very beginning. It probably started, I don't know, at this point, 12, 18 years ago? It's a million years old. What I watch that reminds me of my childhood. I don't have an answer to this question, but what I don't watch that reminds me of my childhood is Pen15. Pen15 is that show about those two very nerdy nerds going through high school or junior high, but it was so exactly what it was like to be made fun of in school that it was, and I was made fun of like no one's business. That it, I just couldn't watch it. There were these boys in our grade who were not kind to. Look, Maya. I need you to beat them up, yeah. TG. Like it just needs to happen. Why should I? See, like I told you, he wouldn't care. This is literally like the worst day of my life, and he'll probably call me you just too. I, I tried, <laughs> I tried, and it was hilarious, but it just felt. It is too soon. 
It's too soon. It's too terrible. Too accurate a depiction. Could not watch it. Never will. Great show. I'll never see it. What I watch that I'm obsessed with right now. The Eyes of Tammy Faye. That was so good. I mean, also, I remember each one of those moments. But it was great. And then I kept forgetting that it was Jessica Chastain. She did such a good job. And Andrew Garfield, I was like, how are they doing this? It was a great movie. The Eyes of Tammy Faye. But I want to laugh. I guess I watch Saturday Night Live. A huge Saturday Night Live guy. Times a million. I love it. I've always loved it. And I'm not one of those freaking turds who's like, it used to be. SNL is good today. It was good yesterday. It was good when I was eight. It'll be good in eight more years. It'll always be good. SNL is always good. Oh, I love Amber. So interesting, too, to hear about the late night shows that Amber loved before landing her own. All right, thanks to uh, Amber for swinging by and hanging with us. We appreciate it. Coming up next, Judy Greer opens up about her dog, Mary, and how Mary's changed her life. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. And welcome back to Popstar Plus. In our My Pet Tale series, we ask folks, of course, about their pets and how the pets that they've had have shaped their lives. Well, Judy Greer has a beloved dog named Mary, and we even learn just how much Mary helps Judy when she feels homesick. My uh, little furry creature, her name is Mary Richards, named after the title, Mary Tyler Moore's character from the Mary Tyler Moore Show. I'm too young to remember it being on television, but um, I watched it, I guess I saw it, you know, probably on like TV Land or one of the cable channels in some hotel room when I was on location working and feeling homesick and it made me so happy. I ordered all seasons on DVD and I used to travel with them so that I could watch them on my laptop when I was traveling for work because it was so comforting to me. I also really responded to the Mary Richards character because it was pretty groundbreaking when you think about it. I mean, this was a woman who broke up with her fiance, moved to the big city, Minneapolis, Minnesota, in order to pursue a career in broadcasting, which again, at the time was very unheard of. Well, I had the most uh, incredible male dog. His name was Buckley and I had him for years and he was my love and my roommate and my best friend. And you know, like all animals, unfortunately, he had to go live on the forever farm with his mom and about a year went by after Buckley left us and my vet Dr. Werber who I loved um, called me one day and was like hey I think it's time and I was like it's not time and he said just I work with a rescue they need a foster over Thanksgiving for this little dog would you just foster her and so that's when I picked up Mary and um, she basically curled up in a ball and just like I carried her around in a tote bag for two weeks and then it was the day before the adoption where I was supposed to take her and then all the people come and like I just lost my mind and I I called my husband and I'm like I can't, I can't get rid of her and he's like oh my gosh I'm about to shoot a live show fine we can keep her like please don't bother me at work anymore so my timing was really good but there was really something so special about having this little creature with me 
um, that did like, I think lower my blood pressure a lot. And I, I can't think of an exact moment in time when I knew she was staying with us, but it just felt like, oh, this is a good thing for me. I feel like I shouldn't have to tell people why it's so important to <laughs> adopt instead of shop. I mean, there's just so many animals that need homes. And there's even now so many like breed specific rescues that if you're like, well, I have to have this kind of breed of dog or I need, you know, hypoallergenic or whatever, like you can find that. There's just so many animals that like are needlessly euthanized. I mean, every day that could easily be adopted into homes. And I think that, you know, Fostering is such a great way to see how a pet's gonna work in your family. I mean, you can find such great animals and they're so happy to have a home and to not have to live in those cages. And Mary's like this tiny little cute, like teddy bear sort of fox raccoon looking dog, but she's really scary if she wants to be. So that took some getting used to and a lot of training. And she has chilled out a lot. She's really feeling self-confident. She's really feeling herself these days. Um, I started traveling with her when I go on location to shoot things and I brought her with me to New Orleans to shoot the thing about Pam and she went over everyone on set and in fact Renee Zellweger's character Pam Hupp has a dog and I can't tell you how many of my friends texted me after that first episode aired and they were like is Mary in the thing about Pam? like no there is only room for one actress in this family um but mary was there and she was like running around and she was such a cutie sometimes when she's like a little judgmental and mean i like to think that she's like my alter ego my favorite thing with mary i love i love going on really long walks and mary really loves to go on long walks we've walked seven miles in one day together I mean, she'll just walk and walk and walk. I think she would walk until she would drop. The thing about Mary that's funny, like the thing about Pam, I just realized I said that. But the thing about Mary that's funny is that she plays really hard to get, but she's so tiny and cute that people keep like, they just keep wanting more of her. They keep wanting her. If she lets, if she lets you pet her once, then you just like want to keep petting her, but like the next day she might be like, I don't really like, I'm not like feeling you today. She really does march to the beat of her own drummer, and she's uh, she's not someone that can be pinned down. You know, like she might like you one day, but then she might not like you ever again. Every day is a new day with Mary. That's what I always tell people. Mary has made my life better in every single way. I used to get so homesick when I was on location, and now like when I have her with me, it's so much better. She's she's gives me a reason to get up in the morning and like on a day off and sometimes I'm like, mm, I miss my husband and I'm homesick. She like, I think genuinely brings a lot of joy to work. Like she runs her all around hair and makeup when we're in the trailer and she loves it and everyone brings treats and gives them to her and she just, animals bring a lot of joy and they definitely like calm people down, I think. And so, um, yeah, she's just made my life better in every single way. Um, Minus the dog hair, that, but she's little and it's not that bad. But I do usually have a lint roller with me. Thanks to Judy for sharing her great pet love. Coming up next, Melissa Joan Hart reminisces over Sabrina the Teenage Witch. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello. Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> the day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now. Streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. 
These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. And welcome back. Melissa Joan Hart was only 20 years old when she landed the role of Sabrina in the Sabrina the Teenage Witch show. And she sat down with us for our flashback series and shared what it was like to work on the 90s sitcom. I guess I would um, describe Sabrina as sort of quintessential teen girl, doesn't want to draw too much attention to herself, but happens to wake up one morning with magical powers and has to deal. Wait. Don't come in here again. From now on, you use the freak's bathroom. <laughs> I was 20 when I started it, and I actually created it. Um, it was an Archie comic, and my mom found the Archie comic book on a playground and she sold it to Viacom as a TV movie. And then my mom kept saying to Viacom, this would be a great series. And they were like, okay, uh, we'll see. And she kept saying, no, 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 it'll be a great series. Like, all right. And she was like, this would be a great series. And they cut it together. She cut it together into a uh, trailer and gave it to the network. And they were like, oh, this is a great idea for a series. She's like, yes, I know. <laughs> so the series came together that way. So uh, I never had an audition. It was my part created for me by my mother. The best part about playing her, so any actor, you know, we like to be actors because we like to kind of slip into lots of different skins and pretend to be lots of different people. And so having a series on the air for seven years for a lot of actors can be kind of tiresome because you play the same character for so long, you, 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 you want to stretch out a little more, you want to do a little more. But with Sabrina, it was great because I got to be everybody plus Sabrina. I got to be Cyrano. I got to be a trapeze artist. I got to be Cinderella. I got to be Rapunzel. I loved when she would take on some kind of personality or some other, um, you know, wardrobe, or I was a snowman, I, I skied on Mars, or, you know, so stuff like that. So that made it really exciting and different, and the actor in me loved that part. We'll see how they like it when they don't have somebody to enforce the law. I swear, the first person I run into. And Zelda? Congratulations. You're the new sheriff. With Sabrina, I was definitely acting because I was definitely playing um, against my type. I was never the wallflower. I was always the one doing a dance performance in the middle of the room or, you know, and here's Sabrina who just wants to be like left alone and quiet and don't let anyone see me. And I'm, you know, I'm going to hide over here. And I just, I didn't quite understand that. So for me, it wasn't the most fun, like the things we were talking about before, like the playing the other roles or getting dressed up in fun costumes. That was all really exciting for me. But the actual character herself, I didn't necessarily identify with. Sabrina, you usually have good ideas. What sort of a fundraiser would you suggest? Pancakes! <laughs> My favorite episode when we were filming it, and still to this day, I think, is probably the pancake episode. I think because it was probably my first time doing physical comedy, and I really loved it. I was like diving in trash cans and, tra and just playing like an addict like that, like just being like, I need a pancake, I need a pancake. And like, it was something I could really, for lack of, for, you know, here's a nice pun, but bite my teeth into. Like I could sink my teeth into like that character. And the fun that I was having playing like a strung out teenager in a kid's sitcom, you know, it was like, it was really fun to play. Like, I know a lot of people get excited that Britney was on the show or NSYNC or Backstreet Boys, but I was always thrilled and I requested, as the executive producer, I could do that. Um, people like the Violent Femmes, Blondie, um, Johnny Mathis for a Christmas episode, you know? I mean, who doesn't want to be with Johnny Mathis when he's singing White Christmas? Lonnie Anderson we had the best time with, or Raquel Welch I had such a great time with. And, you know, all the men on set, of course, were like, oh my God, it's Raquel Welch, you know? And I'm like, I'm getting to act with her for a week. And it was really fun. Getting to go from everything, from pop stars to hardcore rock bands to athletes. Uh, Brady Anderson, I had a massive crush on. He was on the show. Um, some of the guys from like uh, Baywatch and you know, like all these like hot, amazing actors and actresses and 
it, it was just such fun because everybody wanted to come play with us. Everybody wanted to be on a magical show. Everybody's kids watched the show and wanted them on it or something. We had a great chemistry. Everyone was there for the right reasons. Everyone was there knowing that this was a great opportunity. Nobody took it for granted. Everyone rode that roller coaster as long as they could, you know, like knowing this is a, we're on a network show in the heyday of television, you know, not only making good money, but getting a lot of attention for our work. And that's what every actor dreams of, you know? And so we got to be in everybody's house every Friday night and people all across the world felt like they knew us. It's been decades of hearing, you know, I grew up with you. I heard Daniel Radcliffe say it, and I've heard like all these people say, I grew up with you. And you're like, what? Um, so it's, uh, it's, 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 it's the best compliment because it just means that they allowed me in their home and I was there with them. A lot of people, I was there for the hard times. I was there when they're in the hospital. I was there when they were going through depression and felt alone. I was there when they couldn't, you know, I mean, not just me, the whole show, you know, and a lot of the show, a lot of people identify with Sabrina. Uh, because of bullying or because of um, feeling like an outsider. You know, they might not have magical powers, but they feel like an outsider. And so I think that the show gave so many people hope, somewhere to turn to where they didn't feel alone and lonely. And I think that that was, that was like everything, you know? Thanks to Melissa for chatting with us. Last but not least, up next, Gilmore Girls star Kelly Bishop and her love for Emily Gilmore's combative attitude. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. What do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. All right, we're back. Kelly Bishop might be best known for her role on Gilmore Girls as Rory's harsh grandma, Emily, and she was kind enough to reflect on her time on the show with us. How would I describe Emily Gilmore? I used to say Emily Gilmore is a piece of work. She's um, no nonsense. Uh, she's smart. She's uh, conservative. She has values that are very kind of straight-laced. Uh, she's not foolish. She's uh, she's up with current things, but there's a certain uh, value system that she expects people to live by, particularly her daughter. What was my favorite part about Emily? Well, I like the clothes. Uh, they spent a lot of money on my wardrobe. I liked her attitude. I mean, she was so difficult and demanding and uh, hard to please as far as Lorelai was concerned. Uh, and what I really loved about that whole show was Amy Sherman Palladino's writing, because it's some of the best material I've, it's probably the best material I've ever done. And, uh, oh God, amazing. Funny, smart, on top of it, and as everybody knows, really fast. So uh, that was just one of the many favorite things I loved doing that show. Lauren and I, uh, the day we met, it was like, okay, I could do this. And she and I became so close and still are close. She really is like a daughter to me and I really am kind of like a mother to her. We don't spend a lot of time, you know, talking to each other or texting or anything like that, but whenever we get together, it just clicks right in again. There's just a real love and trust and and pleasure. You know, we, we have the same sense of humor. Uh, 
yeah, she's she's great. I'm I'm really crazy about Lauren. My all-time favorite episode. Actually, the one that tickles me the most because it was so different. There was one uh, where uh, Richard, my husband's uh, mother, who was a very difficult woman, uh, had passed away. And uh, I found, if I recall correctly, I found a letter that she had written to him the night before our wedding, I think, begging him not to marry me. I know that the timing of this is particularly awkward since you are to be married tomorrow. No way! But your happiness is too important to me, so timing be damned. She wanted Dad to leave you at the altar. She begged him to leave me at the altar. She begged him in writing, and then she saved the carbon. And uh, that sort of sent me off. He wasn't there to support me because he was so grieving for his mother that during that episode I was drinking. There was even one scene where I was smoking a cigarette. I, said, I called it my, the Tennessee Williams episode for me. Who was that at the door? It was Jason. Dad needs to sign something. Uh-huh. I mean, she was just out there. She was so un-Emily. Uh, that was great fun. I really had fun doing that one. There were a few episodes that I really liked, but that one was just such a departure. The zingers and the put-downs. Oh, boy. Uh, actually, one of my first ones, one of the reasons I loved the pilot script so much, I, I couldn't believe this pilot script when I got it. It was so funny. And I had no idea who any of these people were or, or who the writer was, anything like that. It's when uh, Lorelai comes to see her parents in the pilot script, obviously to ask for money for Rory's education. And uh, I opened the door and I said something to the effect of, is it Christmas? Hi, Mom. Lorelei. My goodness, this is a surprise. Is it Easter already? <laughs> or is it Easter? It was some holiday which was indicative of perfect writing of saying that's how often they saw each other. It was on, on holidays, Christmas, Easter, whatever it was. And then uh, Richard, my husband's character, comes in sometime later after we've done this scene and he basically does the same thing with a different holiday. Hi, Dad. What is it? Christmas already? Lorelai was taking a business class at the college today and decided to drop in to see us. Favorite moments with Ed Herman. I just loved working with him. We really liked each other so much. I know, I know one of my favorite uh, scenes with him was when we did renew our vows and he, we danced to the song Bill and he said today, I mean, that was your favorite, you know, your favorite song and today you can call me Bill. Emily would tease me saying, if only your name was Bill, then this could be our song. Well, Emily, for tonight, and tonight only, my name is Bill, and this is our song. That was wonderful. You know, uh, he was such a good actor and very generous, very professional, but just a sweet, good man. Why is it still cooking? First of all, it's very intelligent. I mean, if you the smarter you are, the more you get it. And it's fast, and so you gotta pay attention. You don't have much time to laugh because you gotta catch up with what's going on. Um, it's funny. I mean, it's, it really is a funny show. But what I decided was that there's really an innate sweetness about it, which sounds kind of icky, but it's not that. There's a, there's a decency about it. Um, and one of the things that men started, when men started watching it, which they weren't inclined to because it was Gilmore Girls and all that sort of thing, uh, is that if you look at the male characters in that show, there's no nasty guy, there's no jerk, there's no misogynist, uh, there's no violence. They're just trying to make their way in the world like all the rest of us. And so there's the, what there is basically is an innate decency about these people. They're good people. There's, some of them are very strange, but they're they're good. And I heard a wonderful uh, story last year sometime that very often um, when the troops come back from maneuvers in places like Afghanistan and places that we you know, hear too much about, they very often sit down and watch Gilmore Girls. And I think it's because it's a feel-good place. It's like this is what America is supposed to be. Great to revisit memories like that. All right, that's going to do it. Thanks for tuning in to Popstar today. As always, we're so glad you joined us. Come back tomorrow and hang out with us again. Same time, same place. See you then. 
I'm Shop Today Editorial Director Adriana Brock, and I know shopping trends. I seek out new and notable products so you don't have to in Editor's Picks. I'm fashion and beauty expert Makon Jovel, and I'm bringing you industry insiders and those in the know to share all the buzzworthy products sweeping social media in Influencer Trends. And I'm Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post. Each week, I'm here with the must-have fashion and beauty products at a price you'll like in Style Finder. This is Shop All Day, the great outdoors. Hey everyone, I'm Adriana Brock and we are back today with another episode of Shop All Day. Summer is heating up and whether you're headed to hike, surf, or just lay on the beach, I've got everything you need to enjoy the great outdoors. From lanterns that are gonna take your trip from camping to glamping, to a car adapter that will keep the kids entertained for the entire road trip. I cannot wait to get started. And remember, see that QR code at the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to all the products on the show today. Or you can text shop to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. Okay, so no one likes mosquito bites or smelly repellent spray. So this first pick is a game changer for those days outside in the summer. According to the brand, they are deep free mosquito repellent patches. They are peel and stick patches that are made with plant-based ingredients like citronella and peppermint essential oils, and they're waterproof. The brand said they repel mosquitoes for three feet for up to six to eight hours. So you can spend more time outside. The brand also says that they're pediatrician approved and safe enough for kids to use. All you have to do is peel one of these stickers and you can put it on your shirt or even your bag to stay protected all day long. I am so excited for summer road trips. And if you are gonna have a car full just like mine, this little car gadget is gonna come in handy when everyone's electronics need a charge on the go. The car power inverter has two AC 110 volt outlets and four USB port chargers. And it's so compact and lightweight, so you can charge all of the family's essentials like laptops, tablets, and cell phones. All right, and whether you are camping or hitting the beach, this next one is a two-in-one gadget you're gonna love. It is a lantern and a phone charger that actually folds down flat and then pops up when you need to use it as a lantern. It has a small solar panel so you can recharge it in a pinch when you're out in the sun. But when it's blown up, it's so lightweight that even the kids can use it. And according to the brand, it's 100% waterproof. And in the dark, this is what it looks like. Okay, this next one you guys have to see to believe. It is an inflatable couch air lounger that provides portable lounging wherever your outdoor adventure takes you. Did I mention you don't even need a pump to blow it up? You guys have to see this. It only takes a few minutes and all you have to do is take it out of this cool little carrying case that it comes with, unclip it, and then whisk it through the air to inflate it. The trick though is to trap air by closing the sleeve, opening little by little. So once it's blown up, according to the brand, it stays that way for up to five or six hours. Plus, it has a pillow-shaped headrest so you get support from head to toe and yes, I've tried it and I actually think it's pretty comfortable. Another summer friendly must have is a pair of lightweight waterproof sneakers. From cruises to beach trips, these are a versatile sneaker that you're gonna wanna wear if you're outdoors near some water. These are great because the brand says that these have an anti-slip outsole with a strong track adhesion. So when you're wet, they're comfortable and you can wear these as walking shoes as well because according to the brand, they dry pretty quickly. Okay, so this umbrella is one of those finds I didn't know I needed until I found it. It is called the Sportbrella and it is a clamp-on shade canopy that provides shade wherever you need it. It has a unique heavy duty universal clamp that you can use on square and tube shaped surfaces. So what does that mean? You can clamp it on anything from a beach chair to a golf bag and even benches. It's also really unique because it has a 360 degree swivel, two button hinges, so you can get shade wherever you need it. And if that wasn't enough, this umbrella, according to the brand, it's made with a UPF 50 material that's gonna provide some serious sun protection. All right, and from fashion to backyard fun, I bet you've been wondering why there's a huge rainbow behind me. Well, this rainbow arc will make your home the place to be this summer. It's a large inflatable sprinkler that all the kids in the neighborhood are absolutely gonna love. 
and you don't need a huge yard to get in on the fun. It's about four and a half feet tall and five and a half feet wide, so it's perfect for the kids to have fun in the sun without the need to drive to the pool or the beach. Let's run through the products one more time. The Evolve Together Mosquito Repellent Patches, the Car Power Inverter, the Luminate Solar Lantern, the Wikapo Inflatable Lounger, the Quick Drying Water Shoes, the Sportbrella, and the H for Happy Gigantic Rainbow Sprinkler. And just so you know, today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. And that is it for our editor's picks. Up next, Mako and Lovu is talking to dermatologist, Dr. Angela Lamb, who is sharing her favorite skincare products to protect your skin in the great outdoors. Plus, she'll spice up your outdoor adventures with some makeup products to keep you looking fresh all day long. Don't go away. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hi there. Welcome back. I'm Makon Jovu, and this is Influencer Trends, where I'll be talking to industry insiders, and they'll share their favorite products and the must-have items to shop for right now. And don't forget the QR code on the corner of your screen. Use the camera on your smartphone and scan it to shop these products. The warm weather is upon us, and people everywhere are looking to soak up some sun. Now, if you want to update your beauty routine for the warm weather, boy, do I have products that are just right for you. Whether you're planning a day trip or a road trip, most of us are looking to protect our skin while also looking for that grand adventure. So I brought in expert dermatologist, Dr. Angela Lamb, to share her favorite buzzworthy products for the great outdoors. Dr. Lamb, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. All right, so when it comes to being outdoors, what are some top essentials for staying safe in the sun? The main essentials for staying safe in the sun are sunscreen, 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 and sun avoidance. So you don't want to be in the sun between the hours of usually 10 a.m. 
to 2 p.m. They say if your shadow is actually shorter than you, mm -hmm. that means the sun is really too high. Oh. Yeah, also, also if you um, are out, you wanna wear some protective clothing, you wanna do broad brim hats, mm -hmm. you wanna wear long sleeve clothing. Actually, a lot of clothing has SPF in it now. So those are really some of the mainstays to staying safe in the sun. That's good to know. I'm gonna spread that to my entire family. I did not know that. Now, we all go to the dentist and we go see our family doctor, mm -hmm. but how often should we be going to see our dermatologist? Most people should check in with their dermatologist yearly. Um, sometimes it depends on your risk factors. So if you have lighter skin, if you spent more time in the sun, if you've had a lot of blistering sunburns, you might want to go every six to nine months. Oh. But most folks, especially over about the age of 30, need to check in yearly. Yearly, okay, good to know. I'm gonna add that to my calendar. All right, let's get into some of these picks. I'm so excited about everything you brought. So let's start with the first one. So this sunscreen, I'm fascinated, the fact that it's like a oily substance. Tell me about it. So what I love about this Melee sunscreen is that it's actually an oil base. It doesn't have mineral oil, but it's clear, it's sheer. You can put it on, you can put it on under makeup. Mm -hmm. um, and it really provides that great SPF. And as you apply it, you see how it has a sheen, yeah. but it creates good moisture without leaving any white cast. That's some of the biggest feedback I get from patients yeah. about sunscreen, is they don't like that white chalky feel. And this, look at how great that just blends into your skin. I mean. um, you get the moisture, you get that glow um, without clogging your pores. That's what I love about it. It's so beautiful. I love this sheen. I'm obsessed with yeah. that already. Now, can <laughs> everybody use this? I know it's maybe for black and brown people. Melee is a brand that actually was formed related for melanin rich skin, but yeah. I like people to know that this is great for any skin type. All right, let's move on to the next product here. I love that this mineral sunscreen has no cast as well. What mm -hmm. other benefits does this mm -hmm. one have? So what's great about this Bliss Sunblock is that it is mineral based. So the key with mineral based, there's pretty much two different types of sunblock you can have. A chemical based sunscreen or sunblock or a mineral based one. This one is fully mineral based, which is good for the coral reef. All of those types of things, patients ask me about that a lot. They wanna make sure that the sunblocks are good for the environment. Mm -hmm. But what's great about this one is the way they've processed it, like you said, no cast either. So if you try that one on, yeah. um, you're not gonna have that white cast. It's good for all skin types. It also has an ingredient in it that actually absorbs oil and actually makes your pores look smaller. Yeah. Um, so that's like a two for one. That's a win-win yeah. situation. Mm -hmm. Now there's a misconception. Can we talk about this elephant in the room that yeah. black and brown folks don't have to oh, wear no. sunscreen? <laughs> we have to wear sunscreen if we're having those grand adventures outdoors, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, even though skin that's darker does have some built-in SPF protection, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that we don't need extra. So it's only about SPF 13 you get when you have darker skin. So this, for example, is SPF 30. You need that extra sunblock and that's what's gonna to prevent us from looking old faster. So that's really the key. Dr. Lamb, thank you for clearing that up. And by the way, you may have earned a commission on a Bliss products on your site. Let's move on to this eyeshadow stick. I want to look fresh when I'm out there in the great outdoors. Tell me about this one. All right, so what's nice about this, you put it on um, and in a little bit of time it sets and you can get in the water and you can be out there. Nobody wants to be in the sun or exercising or sweating and having their makeup running all over their face. So this one is great. It really has staying power. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, people want to look glam when they're on the beach, out in the sun. And so this is really formulated exactly for those purposes. But look at the color payoff as well. I know, they have a broad range of colors. Yeah. So you don't have to sacrifice sacrifice beauty for convenience and safety, so that's important. <laughs> I love how small and portable it is. Yeah. All right, let's move on to other makeup products as mm -hmm. well. When it comes to applying makeup for the great outdoors, right, it's sometimes you wonder, is it light and breathable? Is this one light and breathable? So this MAC foundation is light and breathable. I mean, a lot of people know MAC for their staying power, their ability to hold up under lights, camera action, yeah. um, but this one also holds up in the water, which is really fantastic. Um, and it is breathable, is light, and again, also, you're not going to find it all over your shirt mm -hmm. um, because it sets as well. Look at how it is just melting into my skin. Absolutely love this one. So Dr. Lamb, I have a confession. Mm -hmm. I've actually never used self-tanner before. <laughs> how does this work? All right, so the way self-tanner works is you apply it, there's a chemical compound in there, and if you apply it day after day, particularly this one, which gives you that gradual glow, so after about five to seven days, you're gonna get some increased pigment, um, a nice glow. As a dermatologist, we always say the 
only safe tan is from a bottle, okay? <laughs> okay? So that's the only kind of tan I ever want anybody of any skin type to get. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, this is gradual, so you're not gonna have those streaks that you sometimes can get with some sunless tanners, and it'll just give you that nice, ready to be out in the sun, but again, safely tan. I love this, and I love how also that anyone can use this, mm -hmm. right? Because I just put it on my hands, and I love how it just blends right in seamlessly, too. Mm -hmm. That's the key for so many of these products. We don't want to have you do a lot of work. We want it to be a seamless and have you able to enjoy the sun in the summer. I can't wait for that. All right, so sunburn is one of just the most annoying <laughs> things ever, right, that you can experience. How does this product here from Clarence help to soothe the skin? Yes, so first, I mean, for me, a dermatologist, that's like sacrilege. I never want to have somebody come in and say that they got a burn. But if you did, ideally you will have used some of these first two products to avoid that. But if you do, um, you want something that's gonna be soothing, cooling. This product has a lot of aloe in it. So aloe has a very high water content, um, which is gonna be soothing for you. And one little trick I say is to put that in the refrigerator before you apply it. So when it's actually physically cool, that helps as well. Okay, so do you use this before you get the sunburn or you use it after? No, technically you're supposed to use it after. It's okay. actually called after sun. But again, hopefully you've done the right things. You've applied your sunblock. You wanna always apply it about 20 minutes before you go outside. You've mm -hmm. worn your hat, you've avoided the sun. It smells great as well. Mm -hmm. Liam, I love all your selections. I am ready to get out there and just be out there on my great adventure. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Oh yeah, our pleasure. Now let's run through all the products one more time. We have the Melee No Shade Sunscreen Oil, the Bliss Black Star Sunscreen, the Cargo Cosmetics Swimmables Cream Eyeshadow Stick, the MAC Studio Radiance Face and Body Radiant Sheer Foundation, the Jurgens Natural Glow Self Tan and Moisturizer, and the Clarins SOS Sunburn Soother Mask. And just so you know, today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. Up next, you'll never believe what's in style this summer. Chassie Post is here with the hottest trends for the great outdoors, like the chic fanny pack that's making a comeback. Don't go away. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? What do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas or my birthday or something. <laughs> Welcome back to you today. We got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post, and today 
We've been talking about hitting the roads or trails and taking in the great outdoors. And I can't wait to show you the trends that will have you looking your best while enjoying some fun in the sun. And remember, see that QR code in the corner of your screen. You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. So let's get to it. So let's start off with the cutest matching jacket and short set from Old Navy that is the definition of sporty chic. I love it when brands take functional high-tech performance wear and make it fashion. So let's first talk about the jacket. It's an easy, lightweight, half-zip pullover with a drawstring hood. And check out the color blocking. Such a big trend. I am obsessed with these fun, punchy oranges. So cute. And if you're more of a monochromatic gal, it also comes in a solid black. But also, I am a huge fan of this silhouette. It is so easy to wear. I mean, slightly oversized with that on-trend crop that hits right at the waist, which I think makes it look really flattering. And it even has a drawstring hem. And this fabric, it's fabulous. It's called Stretch Tech. And just like the name suggests, it's got a great stretch to it. And the brand says that it's also breathable with quick drying powers and UV sun protection built right in. But that's just the jacket. Let's complete the set with the shorts. I mean, they're made out of the same stretch tech fabric, but they have an additional feature. Old Navy says that they're also water repellent. And the cut of these shorts is so flattering. They're high-waisted, and they've got a really nice, generous, wide leg opening. And both of those features combined make your legs look really great and elongated. These shorts also have room for all your stuff, loads of pocket, and there's even one hidden stash zip pocket that can hold your phone. But if you're not a matching set fan, no worries. These two pieces also work great as separates to mix and match with the rest of your closet and come in tons of summer colors in sizes ranging from extra small to 4X. So we're gonna look great out there this summer. <laughs> Workout or weekend, we've got you covered with this sporty set. Next, one of my absolute favorite sporty must-haves and one of the summer's biggest trends, the exercise dress. And just like the yoga pant, you don't actually have to be exercising to wear it. So whether you're running around town doing errands, heading to the gym, or hitting the tennis court or golf course, the exercise dress is going to keep you looking and feeling cool. Now, I've actually got three of these very same dresses and they make a really great warm weather uniform. And I'm not alone. We've seen it all over social media. And once you try one, you'll see what everybody's so excited about. I mean, first of all, it's got the best of two worlds. You've got this easy A-line dress, which is inspired by tennis core slash all things tennis style, which is a huge trend right now, combined with the practicality and relative modesty of a skirt. See right under the skirt? You've got biking shorts with two pockets. It's almost like shapewear. And this one's from Amazon and is a really great example of the trend. So next, we've got two versatile pairs of performance pants that you are going to love for all of your outdoor activities this summer. So first up, meet the Climatrail zip-off pant. Now this pan is by Eddie Bauer and it's genius and perfect for those days where it starts out cool and gets warmer as the day goes on. And here's how they work. They start out as a full length pant and then as the temps rise, you can just zip off the bottoms and you got a pair of shorts. And how cool is that? And check out this fabric. The brand says it's made out of a four way stretch that's also water repellent and has UPF 50 plus sun protection. And did we mention that they were also flattering? We give a thumbs up to the mid-rise silhouette. We've also got another equally versatile outdoor pant from Amazon that is a number one bestseller. These easy to wear joggers are also made out of a performance fabric that the brand says is lightweight, quick dry, and water resistant and shoppers rave about how comfortable these pants are. According to the brand, the fabric has 8% spandex and it's got an easy elastic waistband with a little drawstring so you can adjust the fit. And check out all these pockets. You've got two side zip, two cargo, and one 
back zip pocket. So no wonder they're so popular. And yes, these pants are perfect for outdoor adventures, hiking, working out, walking, you name it. But they also make excellent travel and lounge pants. Now, if you've been looking for an easy and stylish way to protect yourself from the sun-strong UV rays this summer, then you're going to love these multitasking swim tees from Land's End. They're designed to just wear over your swimsuit top. And according to Land's End, they're made out of a moisture-wicking stretch fabric that keeps you dry and comfortable on land. The brand says, besides providing more coverage from the sun than a typical bathing suit, that they also offer UPF 50 protection, which really comes in handy if you spend a lot of time at the pool or the beach. Plus, I am loving their surfer chic vibe. I mean, look at these stripes here. That's where rash guards actually got their start, protecting surfers from rough boards. And now they've gone mainstream, protecting us all from the sun. And I'm really into the classic crew neck style. And you can choose from either short sleeves or long sleeves. And they come in so many vibrant colors and patterns. And the best part, they're not just for swimming. They also work as a colorful cover-up. Moving on to New England chic, meet the Marley Lily monogrammed Nantucket cover-up. And she is cute. We all need a great cover-up and we could not be more obsessed with this one. Yes, we love the loose fitting, flattering V-neck silhouette, the easy butterfly sleeves and the classic seersucker print fabric. But let's be honest, this cover-up had us at the word monogram. See right here on the hem? You can choose from several monogram styles and three pretty colorways. The blue seersucker, we've got the pink seersucker, and we've also got a mint seersucker. Plus, talk about beach to brunch and beyond. You can throw on this fabulous cover-up over your suit, add a pair of gold hoop sandals, and you are ready for dinner. Just like that. And if you really want to do it up, they even make a matching monogram straw hat in my favorite surfer style. Talk about fun in the sun. Next, don't get me started on my love of fanny packs slash belt bags, or in this case, the bum bag, because I really, really love them. And there's a reason that this 90s style is back in such a big way. They're just so incredibly useful. Now, this is the Moonbeam bum bag, and I am a huge fan of anything that allows me to go hands-free. And I have to tell you guys, I wear my fanny pack every single day. And in my humble opinion, this sporty style is the ultimate in hands-free, utilitarian style. Now, we found these adorable takes at Madewell. They're designed by a Los Angeles-based brand called Lola, known for their stylish carryalls inspired by California beach life. Now, they've got a classic half moon shape, thus the name, and you can wear them around your waist, a la the classic bum bag, or you can wear them over your shoulder as a crossbody. And it's the perfect size for your on-the-go essentials. This new collection is designed from recycled nylon with cool details like a chunky zipper, and I love the bold candy colors. And of course, one of this bag's finest virtues is its versatility. With that hands-free storage, this is the bag you want coming along for the ride, whether you're headed on an outdoor adventure, to a fun barbecue, or to the grocery store. And last but not least, Put your hands together for one of my favorite summer innovations, the ponytail hat. This hat just might be my favorite summer accessory ever. It's genius and hysterical, and I've seen the ponytail baseball hat before, but never the ponytail sun hat. Thank goodness someone came along and designed a hat that doesn't make me choose between my beloved high pony and sun protection. And let's face it, getting your hair off your neck feels a whole lot cooler when it's scorching hot out there. This hat also has a lot of bells and whistles. It's got a good wide brim, three and a half inches, breathable mesh sides, and both the hat and the chin strap are adjustable. Plus, the brand says that it's waterproof, quick drying, and even has a built-in sweatband. It's also packable, so you can fold it up and throw it in your bag and go. Plus. 
It comes in over 16 different colors. Yes, this is a hat that both you and your ponytail are gonna love. Okay, so let's run through these products one more time. We've got the Old Navy Color Block Jacket and Shorts, the Amazon Sleeveless Workout Dress, the Eddie Bauer Zip-Off Pants, the Libin Cargo Joggers, we've got the Lands End Rash Guards, the Marley Lily Monogram Hat and Cover-Up, the Madewell Lola Bum Bag, and the Ponytail Sun Hat. And that's a wrap on Style Finder and for our show. It's been fun showing you our favorites, so tune in for an all new episode of Shop All Day. I love the city of Baltimore. I've been coming here for years. And if there's one thing I know, the city of Baltimore is serious about his crab. I love Baltimore crabs. This is the, the, the stomping and grind of crabs. And I've been eating crabs since the time I could sit up at a table. It's a little spicy, salty, and savory, all in one. If I could describe the taste, you can't. You just have to try it. <laughs> you just have to try it. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. When you think Maryland, you got to think Blue Crab, an essential part of the state's culture and cuisine. And no place knows how to cook it up quite like Baltimore. I mean, just as many ways as you can count, you can find ways to eat crab. Of course, there's your basic, your, your steamed crab with the beautiful spices, and you just start whacking that bad boy. You can get all that beautiful meat out. You can get cra canned crab if you'd like. Uh, of course, there's also the fabulous crab mac and cheese with a hot dog. There's the crab dip, there's your crab soup, and of course, the king of crab, the crab cake. Yes, but this is a cake that needs no icing. Mm. Crab cakes have been enjoyed by many for centuries throughout the Chesapeake region. But here in Baltimore, they're a way of life. And one of the city's most popular go-tos is tucked away just inside the world-famous Lexington Market. We're headed back to Houston today and we wanted to have the best crab cake in town. We're from Orlando, glad to be here. People have been coming to Fabies for years. Yes. Ever since I was little and I'm um, 25. <laughs> People from all around the world come here to Baltimore just to grab a bite of the famous Fadley's Crab Cake. It's made with fresh Maryland crab and family love. Everybody looks the same. How are you, my dear? Hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> How are you, sir? You looking good? You're looking great. Got something for you. All right. There you go. There you go. You need one of those. Oh, yeah. There you are. Now I'm feeling really crabby. <laughs> Pardon me. I've, I've got to get a lawyer because there's a clause I have to have checked. <laughs> I've known the folks at Fadley's Seafood for years, but they've been serving up fresh crab cakes even longer. Hi, I'm uh, Nancy Fadley Devine. I own Fadley Seafood. It's been uh, in my family now for, well, four generations, and the fifth is coming up, so we've been around a long time. I think people are astonished to see my parents at 84 and 89 still working. You can get another five pants and do a second batch if you need to with them. People ask her for her autograph, they ask her for her picture, they ask her to hold their babies. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really fun. I mean, here's this company that's been part of Baltimore for over 130 years. Yeah, right. Uh, what, why, what, what is it about your place that has people coming back 
Right. I think it's that people come in here and go right away. There's a warmth. Uh -huh. There, it's like walking in somebody's home. That's they're they're happy to have you. Uh -huh. You know, come and you feel. Oh my gosh, I feel at home. And I get people. We were here 20 years. It's exactly the same. In fact, Fadley still stands in its original location, founded here by John W. Fadley Sr. in 1886. Started off as a seafood stall, but over the generations grew into a Baltimore tradition, led by Bill and Nancy Devine, along with their daughter. Damie Hahn, and I am the fourth generation of Fadley's, so I do everything. <laughs> Give them a little bit of a smorgasbord of, of everything. Going over here to fillet a fish, over here to shuck an oyster, over there to steam a crab, back here to fry, up here to make a crab cake, back down on the phone, running in the shipping department. A tray like that is about, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bushels of crabs in order to get that tray. That's a lot of picking, and I don't think people realize how much work goes into getting an all jumbo lump. Growing up, did you did you think you were going to end up here? You were going to be doing this? No, no. But it was hard to get away from, and I couldn't see it going away. I couldn't see see it ending with my parents. So the pandemic hit. Yes. You really had to step up. My father called me, and I said, Dad, you guys cannot come in here. You know, the, we, we don't know anything about this this virus and, and the effects, especially on the elderly. And I know you want to be here, but you can't. And he said, Damien, do whatever you do, whatever you can to make payroll. It just makes me cry when I think about it. Um, he said, just make sure that we don't have to lay anybody off. I don't want to lay anybody off. I don't want anybody to lose their job. And we did it. And I saw it back when I came here in the 90s, and I still see it today. This truly is a family. Oh, it is a family. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny because I often tell people, mom and dad don't treat the employees any differently than they treat me. And that's the God's which honest good, truth. <laughs> which could be a good or a bad. <laughs> that's the God's honest truth. And that's why you end up having so many multi-generation families staying here. That's right. Fadley's isn't just a family-owned business. It's run by family as well. Multiple generations of employees, father and daughter, father and son, mom and daughter, all building a home here. I've been here since a junior in high school, so I've been doing the thing for a while. I'm gonna say it's been around 33, 34 years. And I started at the end of 79, a uh, week before my son was born. I started at 14 years old, and I'll be 42 years old in December. It's always a challenge working with family. <laughs> a lot of personalities, but you love each other and it always works, you know, it always works well. What's, what's really, really bad is when your kids are grandmothers. Mom, we were in the middle of an interview. <laughs> oh, you just broke in. <laughs> you have to start over? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you were saying about the challenges of working with family? <laughs> While the family spirit makes customers feel at home, it's Fadley's crab cakes that keep them coming back. What kind of oil do you cook your crab cakes in? Soybean. Soybean, thank you. So excited to have this crab cake. And I watch people for the first time put it in their mouth and they go, oh my God. <laughs> and, I go, and they're standing at a table in a market. Yeah. They're not sitting down to a white tablecloth and having somebody serve it on a silver platter. It's on a paper plate, but it's, it belongs on a silver platter. Nancy created a recipe in 1987, saying she's never changed it. So besides yourself, how many other people know the Fadley's Crab Cake recipe? I sleep with her, she won't tell me. <laughs> he doesn't even know how to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> Why would I tell him? <laughs> so some people use breadcrumbs. You use it's crushed broken up saltines. Saltine. Broken saltines, yes. And not, not fine because no. you have to use more. Now, so, and then this is the magic sauce. Is this the secret sauce? Yes. So it's just enough to mix the ingredients it's together, right. nothing more. That's right. And the fine. big and ball of crab right there. That's it. Boom.
look at this. Oh boy. Oh. It's just like I remember eating it 26 years ago. You know what? I'm told that all the time when people come in here. The best part about this is you haven't changed a thing. Now this is a legacy. Well, we know how the crabs end up, but how do they get them? Let's go find out. Coming up, the generations of black watermen who've made a living pulling in Maryland's most famous catch. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. We got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? From New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Chesapeake Bay men and women who work these waters are probably just as famous as the legendary catch that they pull out. And in fact, it's backbreaking work that is passed on from generation to generation, including blackjacks. Those were the black watermen who worked these waters all the way back into the 1800s and are a vital part of this community. The Chesapeake Bay is home to a vast variety of seafood, but none as valuable or as well known as the blue crab. The catch here makes up over a third of the nation's supply, and on average, more than 50 million pounds of blue crabs are harvested from the bay. I'm Captain Tyrone Meredith, charter boat captain, owner and operator of the Island Queen 2. Captain Meredith knows these waters well, he grew up on them. I'm the fourth generation uh, waterman, and my grand, great grandfather, he worked on the water, my grandfather, and my father. We've been here ever since the 1860s, making a living working on the Chesapeake Bay. This has been the way of life for generations of watermen here in Kent Narrows, a town just 50 miles south of Baltimore. For hundreds of years, they've caught, processed, and sold blue crabs to markets up and down the eastern shore. By the mid to late 1800s, Kent Narrows had also become one of many unlikely havens on the bay for free and enslaved African Americans. There was more black uh, watermen anywhere on the whole east coast, probably in the United States. Those watermen, also known as blackjacks, forged their path to liberation on the water. Their expertise is essential to the booming seafood industry. So much so, the government granted some black watermen seamen's protection certificates, providing sailors with American citizenship and a path to economic freedom. Hey, Lewis, I'm coming up on you now. Okay, I got you. Yeah. Oh. 
Howdy, bite in the day. This morning is pretty good. Well, being out here is your own boss. You eat what you want to do. And let nobody tell you, go get me this or go get me that. It's Seventy-five-year-old Lewis Carter still finds that same sense of freedom on the water today. He's also one of the last generations of black watermen alive. Every morning before the sun rises, he sets out to catch crabs in the bay. I started in 1961, now I'll be 15, and I've been at it ever since. Right now, uh, I'm going down the line, and I, when I get to the other end, I'll throw it off. Crabs will come up on that bait. The pressure from the water pushes them back in this dipper. Okay, these are the big, large males. You put them in one basket. That's a female with red claws. Put them in one basket. He's one of the last Mohegans left. There's not too many people that still work, make a living from the water. Most of them moved away, got all the jobs, and it's changing because it's harder to make a living from the bay. Crabbing season runs from spring into late fall, but changes in climate, cost, and labor have made each successive year more challenging. As younger generations take up new trades, there are less people working the waters and ultimately fewer black watermen. Back when I started, it was a plenty of black water, but they died out and the younger ones never taken their place. It, you know, in one way, it makes me feel bad, you know, and I don't think it'll be no chance no more black water. I really do believe that. Captain Meredith estimates there are fewer than a dozen black watermen on the bay. Like many of his peers, he's had to turn to other work. Back when I was crabbing teenager, I caught high as 50 bushel a day. Right now, crab is catching two or three bushel a day. Now I started running charters, fishing charters, because crabbing started declining and, and the fishing was more lucrative money-wise. And educational. His charters are an opportunity to keep stories of the blackjacks alive for generations ahead. Although tradition on these waters is changing, one thing remains the same. Nothing tastes like the Chesapeake Bay Maryland crab. It's got that certain taste to them. It, it, it's the only place like that in the world is the Chesapeake Bay Blue Crab. Next, an up and coming Baltimore chef inspired by his family's love of cooking. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> the day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. 
the day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Back in Baltimore, a new generation is putting a spin on the crab cake. I'm Alex Perez. I'm the owner of Poppy Cuisine. I'm an artist at heart, so uh, cooking, um, the arts of culinary, you know, that's something that I'm very passionate about. Not necessarily having a recipe to go off of and just getting in the kitchen, freestyling and coming up with a masterpiece. It's that freestyling approach that brings people through these doors, clamoring for a taste. Jumbo, what crab, crab is king in Baltimore, so um, you're going to see crab cakes, uh, crab cake fries, crab cake egg rolls. Everyone's been going crazy over it as well. This is the ball. So I just come back for that and I enjoy it every time I come here. We actually live in DC, so we rode all the way up here an hour just to come here. Right now I'm drizzling our warhead and our aioli sauces on it. I have a family from the Dominican Republic. I'm Afro-Latino. I'm black on my mother's side. And pretty much I'm just always had a love for food and uh, cooking food, eating food. So learning how to cook from my, my dad. So my dad taught me how to cook at the age of 10. I grew up, you know, watched my grandmother cook a, a lot as well. So I started pretty much combining the uh, foods that I learned to cook from my grandmother with the foods I learned how to cook from my father. And that's kind of like how the uh, whole poppy cuisine, you know, was, was born it's in her kitchen, essentially. That was eight years ago. While working a full-time job, Alex began building a new business on the side, catering food out of his grandma's kitchen. In February 2020, he was finally able to open a restaurant. Then the pandemic hit. Of course, you know, a month later, we get the news that we have to shut down and only do takeout. So that just opened up the, uh, the, the floodgates essentially. And you have people standing in line, hundreds of people <laughs> on the block and in that mass, you know, cars double parked up and down the streets. And it was, it was just may, it was mayhem. During a global crisis, the city Alex was born and raised in rallied around him. Now, Poppy Cuisine is packed with locals and tourists alike. But the chef stays true to his roots, running it with close family and friends. My little sister, Natasha. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Natasha, my big bro, Alex. I can employ family members, friends, and so forth, you know, the people who I grew up with, people that I'm close to, and it's very rewarding, you know. Coming up, I'm going to grab my apron and join Alex and Grandma Gloria for a lesson in cooking crap. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Ali Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. We got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Hey, how's it going? Nice to meet you. I wanted to meet Alex and his grandma Gloria, the inspiration behind his cooking. So I dropped by their kitchen to say hello. 
Uh, well, I know. I picked up from my grandmother, my mother-in-law, uh -huh. and um, just put my own spin on certain dishes. I didn't follow it to the, the recipe to the letter. So you're able to add a little bit. Yeah. But he's always asked me uh, when I fix the dish, well, what did you put in this? How did you do, how did you do this? And I would tell him, I said, you don't have to follow to the letter, you know, put your own spin. And Alex has done just that, turning the classic crab cake into an egg roll. Genius! The ingredients, simple. A pound of jumbo lump crab, panko breadcrumbs, aged cheddar cheese, egg roll wrappers, and a couple of sauces and microgreens to top it off. There's the star of the show, the crab meat. Put on an apron, I've got rubber gloves on. All right. Patient's ready. So how do we get started, Alex? Yeah, so first what you want to do is say we have some uh, Maryland jumbo lump crab here. Uh -huh. So for the most part, I shouldn't have much shells in, but mm -hmm. uh, typically uh, I like to sift through it. Just got to see if there's any shells, and if so, you can put the shells right back in this oh. uh, container. There you go. So, Gloria, did you know you were ra helping raise a, a culinary genius? <laughs> well, no, but I know he liked to eat. <laughs> <laughs> This sauce in particular is our, our crab sauce mix. Okay. So we're gonna drizzle a little bit at a time. Cause I don't wanna put too much, right. just enough to uh, bind. You got enough for Al? Yep, I think I'll have enough. Oh, she's, she's stay by me, I like this. I like this lady. This is why I'm so particular uh, about, you know, when I'm doing things in the kitchen. Uh huh. Start actually rolling these things up. Yes. Why? Why? Why do you think this this recipe is, is so popular at the restaurant? The most popular. Um, well, I think uh, because it, it pretty much gives you the ability to uh, take a a bar more favorite and you know make it handheld and on on the go. Uh -huh. You know, it's throwing your hand. Kind of street eat. food. Isn't yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. So I think that's one of the, the biggest reasons it's it's very popular. Other than the taste as well. Right, well, exactly. You know. <laughs> yeah, because that's You can take it with you, but if it's not right, tasty, right, exactly. right, uh, come back for it. Yeah, so what we're going to um, do is uh, we're going to take like a, a pinch of uh, crab. It's around like a, a quarter cup or so. Mm -hmm. We're going to sit in the middle. Is that too yeah. much? Yeah, we're going to take a little bit out, a little pinch out. Actually, we want to put a little bit more in. Yeah. Which is it? <laughs> All right, so that's perfect right there. Right, perfect, sorry. perfect. <laughs> and we're gonna Just literally fold them up envelope style. What, what is it about cooking and family that, that, that is so important? Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, you know, living a, a busy life as a business owner and a dad, a husband, and things like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, food is an uh, opportunity for family to come together, you know, talk about things, especially if you haven't seen each other in a long time. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a way for us to connect, so. Yeah. And Lurie, is, it, is it true you've never done this before? No, I haven't. It's true. Oh. Could have fooled me that you never did this before. Look at that. <laughs> Bam! Done! Faster than I did. Wow! <laughs> Wow, that natural grandma thing. Love it. So now we're gonna get get the deep fryer up here and fry these bad boys up. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Woo! You had to describe the heart of your cuisine. What is it, and and how does Baltimore uh, kind of part of that? Pretty much my my story, and I think that connects very well to our Baltimore. You know because. You know, I, I grew up here, you know, all my life, and I think everything that um, I faced during the time that, you know, I, I started this company up until now, I've been transparent about, and it resonated very well with the uh, the, uh, the people in Baltimore, and they, they watched my journey through the years, and I feel like that's that's really the, the heart of what mm -hmm. I do. Make sure and the around the edges and things like that, so that's why I keep turning them, you know, so it doesn't uh -huh. fry on one particular side too much. And, Want to even fry? Mm. Nice and golden. So you want to cut these diagonally. So, yeah. so I'm going to drizzle. This is our aioli sauce, house made, and this is our warhead sauce right here. <laughs> so the sauce is kind of sweet, has a tangy bite to it. Oh, kind of like Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's right. Well, I guess there's only thing, one thing left to do. Yeah, and I try the piece. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Crab 
cake egg roll. Here we go. Wow. Chef Al, you have done Baltimore proud. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Our time here in Baltimore is coming to an end. We tried the traditional crab cake, tasted a modern spin with crab cake egg rolls, and even went straight to the source on the Chesapeake Bay. At the center of it all, one thing still ringing true, food tastes better when you eat it with family. If you ask most people, they'd say reaching the NFL would be a career pinnacle, the top of the mountain. But for my guest today, the NFL was just the beginning. As a linebacker who played on three pro teams retiring in 2015, Emmanuel Acho was just getting started. Turns out Emmanuel's calling was off the field in missionary work and more recently, social justice. Just under two years ago, Emmanuel decided to create and host an online video series of conversations about racism called Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. It's since been viewed more than 80 million times and went on to win an Emmy in 2021. And now Emmanuel is setting out to help others find meaning in their lives. Emmanuel, what a pleasure it is to have you on Making Space. I feel like you are our perfect guest because you are somebody who follows uh, a part of you that isn't always your intellect. It isn't always your pro-con list. You go with something that is beyond that. Since you were a kid, let's go back, let's go back. Since you were a kid and you were making decisions on where to go, what to do, what led you? I've never been asked that question before. I am led by my convictions. And so when, when I say conviction, what do, we, what do you mean? I'm led by some innate inner yearning to move, to act, to go. Um, that's truly what led me, it's my convictions. And so if I ever feel convicted to move in a certain way, a certain direction, that is the manner in which I go. Sometimes it makes no practical sense at all. Um, but I just feel like you have to move by convictions. I mean, look, when you're a kid, you don't know what the risks are. There are no risks. You jump off the swing, you jump off, you'll realize later that that hurt. But you're free because you don't know the risks. It's like someone who's never had their heart broken. They fall in love harder. How did you manage to keep that even though you've been through disappointments, things that hadn't worked in your life? What was it, um, Michael Jordan, uh, who said, like, I missed so many thousands of shots um, but nobody ne necessarily remembers the misses. It's Babe Ruth, who I believe said, your next strikeout only brings you closer to your next home run. I don't try to focus on my failures. The only true failure is in not getting up. The only true failure is in not trying. Hold on, I was thinking about it the other day um, after I failed at something recently, and I was like, I didn't fail, I fell. And as long oh. as I get up, I win. I love that. You're the you're the child of immigrants. By the way, um, I have to let you know that when I was in third grade, I went to school in Ibadan, Nigeria for a year. My dad was a professor there. Yeah, we really? went to school. Yes, we have <laughs> such fond memories. It was just a year as the child of immigrants. I, and I'm a child of, of immigrants, too. I feel like there's something different that's in us. What did your parents give to you that led you to the man who you are today well when you travel the world and you see other parts of the world your mind and the aperture of your understanding is just so opened what did my parents give me a certain resiliency i just learned a different type of resilience i learned a different type of understanding of how blessed we are in america you don't really understand the american dream until you realize the nightmare is somewhere else and i've just lived other countries nightmares and so i i, I understand a difference in a dream and you've lived the american dream too boy <laughs> did you feel like this feels like my mountaintop you know, I didn't. The NFL was truly amazing. It was amazing. But unless you are in the top five percentile, the NFL, it too is scary. The reason I didn't feel like it was my mountaintop, I knew the NFL was a means to an end. Hold on, I like answering questions in story form. I vividly remember fearing I was going to be released every day I was in the NFL. 
The NFL, you have 53 people on a roster. Essentially, you have 53 employees. I was probably the 47th to the 53rd person on the roster as far as importance. Every Tuesday of an NFL week is when you get paid. So if you are on the roster on Tuesday, you know you are going to receive a check that week. So that means by Monday night, you likely will be released if you are going to be released. I was cut in the NFL five times before the age of 25. Imagine being hired at a job out of college, then being transferred across the country from that job, then being fired by your employer who transferred you, and then being rehired and fired and rehired and fired and rehired and fired five times all by the age of 25. So the NFL to me was, it was so taxing. It was so anxiety uh, heavy. The NFL was not a highlight of my life. Oh, wow. Why did you stay in it as long as you did? In the NFL, if you play for four years, you're vested pension and you have annuity. And so the NFL was practical. I was like, okay, play four years. You have all the benefits. As soon as I hit four years, I was like, it is time to get out of here. So it was an easy decision. Simple. Not at all. Not easy. Why? Because the NFL, it cripples every one of your abilities besides playing sports. That's what nobody tells you. Imagine you graduate with a degree, which, by the way, is already hard if you're trying to make it to the NFL because playing college sports is a full time job. But imagine graduating with a degree. Then whatever degree you graduate with, you have to put on ice for four, five, six, seven, eight, nine or ten years. So all of that knowledge which you have acquired is now gone to waste because you have been sitting here trying to play in the NFL. So transitioning is near impossible because it's all you've ever known. Every August, think about this, for 20 consecutive years, really 17, from when I was eight years old until I was 25 years old, every August I was wearing a football helmet. Then you wake up one August day and you're not putting a helmet on. It's, it's depressing. It's saddening. You go into dark places. You talked about how you stayed in the NFL for four years so you could get vested, you could get this. You, to me, if I'm listening to you and not knowing anything about you, seem like a very logical guy. I love that your book is called Illogical because it really, there is something beyond a pro-con list in life. What kept you kind of jumping in the deep end, even if you knew the odds were against you? Our greatest accomplishments in life, our greatest accomplishments in life come on the other side of our logic. So what is keeping me from my destiny? And that's really the way in which I operate. The, the scariest phrase that can ever be uttered is that's the way we've always done things or that's the way I've always done things. And I just understand that our greatest accomplishments, my greatest accomplishment, your greatest accomplishment, I guarantee it'll come on the other side of my logic. So how can I be more illogical? Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? Well, I love that, you, which you just dovetailed nicely into your uncomfortable conversations with a black man. I mean, this is something that you 
felt a burning desire to do. People told you it was not a good idea. They said no. People close to yes, me. You're... But this was, this is, yes, imagine you're an athlete and you ask your coach what you should do and your coach says don't do something. Imagine you are a child and you ask your parent what you should do and your parent says don't do something. But I had a calling and what I realized, Hoda, is my calling wasn't a conference call. Hmm. Uh, my calling was my calling and only I got that calling. Nobody else heard what I heard. And it wasn't audible. It was within my own soul, my own spirit, if you will. How did you know that this was not something to ignore? I knew it was not something to ignore because I didn't have the luxury of ignoring it. What lives were going to be lost because of my lack of speech? And I think we all eventually have to ask ourselves that question. And it might not be a literal loss of life like a death, but what dream won't be fulfilled because I'm too afraid to act, because I'm so bound by logic? It might be my own dream. It might be a community that I might change. It might be a family that I might impact. It might be a neighborhood. It might be a city. It might be a religious gathering. But like, who am I costing because of my lack of courage? So many people ask me, Hoda, Emmanuel, how do you find your calling? Mm -hmm. And after pausing and thinking, I said, your calling will call you. Just pick mm -hmm. up. So many people are searching left and right. I don't know what my calling is in life. I don't know what my purpose is in life. I don't know what I'm meant to do. Yo, your calling will call you and it probably already has. You're just not picking up. My calling literally called me. Matthew McConaughey, he called me from a no-caller ID number after my first episode of Uncomfortable Conversations got 25 million views. I picked up, Acho, McConaughey speaking. I want to have a conversation. I was like, what? Ma Ma Matthew McConaughey? <laughs> um, he's like, yeah, I want to have a conversation. I was like, Okay, well, we'll record episode two in four days. True story. I did not want to do another episode of Uncomfortable Conversations because of how big the first one was. McConaughey says, let's record it tomorrow. After McConaughey calls me, I get another call from a no caller number, uh, caller ID number. Hi, Emmanuel. Oprah Winfrey speaking. Uh, Oprah? Like, <laughs> Oprah, Oprah? Emmanuel, what is your intention? She asked uh, me. Which, yeah, um, what did you say? That's good. I, I said, Oprah, my intention is to change the world, and I truly believe I can. All of that to say to those listening, your calling will call you. You just have to make that a logical decision to pick up. My calling was a literal no caller ID calls, but other people's calling will just be that internal yearning and that internal desire to do something that just seems a little crazy. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to today. We got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it. Yeah. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now.
Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You know, they say that when you find your calling, you, it's like you're riding a wave. Your whole life you swim upstream and all of a sudden you find the thing that you're supposed to be doing and suddenly you feel like all of the forces of the universe are taking you in the way you're supposed to be going. You're on this ride. Do you feel like that's what's happening or are you swimming up? Man, what's interesting, when you say riding a wave, I think there's inher an inherent sense of ease that seems like yeah. it comes with that. I do believe your calling is what you're made for and your career is what you're paid for. Uncomfortable conversations is the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Uh, so I can't say that I'm riding a wave yeah. because it's just so incredibly difficult. But your calling is just what you're made to do. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it is a detour. And uncomfortable conversations was a detour. It was not my destination. Illogical was my destination. Mm -hmm. um, living a life and encouraging people to live their best life, that was my destination. I got my master's degree in sports psychology. So talking about, hey, let's all achieve the dreams we so desperately desire, that was my destination. Hoda, I just had to take a quick detour um, for the, for the <laughs> betterment of those around me. I was reading a book and they were talking about how that in this big field there was one wildflower growing and that everything on God's earth knows exactly what it is supposed to do without being told or thought out. That wildflower wasn't meant to be famous or popular or make lots of money. That wildflower is meant to bloom in the middle of that field, face the sun and make us all feel good. That was its purpose. And they said how people were the only thing in God's earth who don't really have to, have to sort of figure it out or spend our lives trying to be more like this one. I'm gonna yeah. be like Oprah, I wanna be like Denzel. Yeah. I wanna take a page from that. How is it that you were able to find, because it sounds like you have your voice, how did you find it and how do you think people can find it? Because everyone wants to look like that one, dress like that one, be like that one. It's in realizing that you have to be yourself because everybody else is already taken. Mm. And what I've realized is just, I have to be the best version of me. And the what you said is so wonderful about the wildflower. I think the problem we all collectively have as humans is we all have this innate desire to want to be like somebody else instead of simply being the best version of ourselves. Mm. And that is when I talk about like, it's just conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom says we should all do X, we should all do Y, we should all do Z, we should all go to high school, then we should all go to college, then we should all get a job, then we should all get married, then we should all have kids, and we should all live in a house behind a white picket fence. And the problem is, conventional wisdom is limiting all of us, in my greatest opinion. Conventional wisdom is limiting us from the life that we all deserve to be living. And I just finally said, wait a second, why am I going to live inside of someone else's box? Why am I going to let insignificant people have such significance in my life? Clearly faith is front and center with you. It comes out in almost every single answer that you are giving me. Sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it's subtle, but it's always there. Um, how has your faith played in, uh, in this journey of yours? My faith has driven me in this journey. And what I believe is we all have faith. The question is, when you sit down in a chair, you have faith that that chair is going to hold you up. Mm -hmm. So we are all, to some degree, people of faith. My faith drives me because, one, I understand what I've put on this earth to do, and it's just to touch lives, it's to, to share the good news, it's to, to talk about Jesus when I can. Um, but more than that, or not more than that, but in alongside with that, faith can be illogical. <laughs> like... <laughs> Like, that's what people don't understand. Like, whether it is, think about this for a second. Noah was commissioned by God to build a boat and put every animal on it because there was going to be a flood. Hoda, can you imagine how many people saw Noah building every day saying, bro, what the heck are what you doing? <laughs> right, like, you right. are a fool until he looks out of the window and he puts his head up into the sky and then he get he feels it between his brows smack dab it's the first drop of rain mm. and the first drop of rain tells him that the flood is coming and i have a chapter actually titled the first drop of rain because when you've been illogical when i've been illogical that first drop of rain is going to hit. And when that first drop of rain hits you, that is when you know the flood is coming. So what was my first drop of rain? 
that call for Matthew McConaughey. Mm. The call for Matthew McConaughey, I hadn't yet written a book. I hadn't yet heard from Oprah. I hadn't yet been a bestseller. I hadn't yet won an Emmy. I hadn't yet done anything besides a video. But when McConaughey called, that was my first drop of rain, and that was the signal that the flood is coming. So when you make that a logical decision, whether it's be building a boat, whether it's uh, sitting in front of a camera, whether it's starting a business, as soon as you get that first drop of rain, you know the flood is coming. And my faith literally moves me in life because it, it mm. is testaments like that. Wow, that is absolutely beautiful. And I know you, your book, Illogical, you say that's your calling, like that's what you're meant to do. You're meant to help, you're meant to heal, you're meant to encourage and cheerlead. I mean, that's so in your DNA. But there are a bunch of people, many people, and we've all been there ourselves too, if we're not there right now, it's you're lost. Like things aren't working for me, you know, and they're trying to figure out how to get up, how to pull up. Um, I know you've, you've got your faith and you've also got your sports psychology degree. You've got a lot going for you, but how, how do you speak to someone like that? Well, the first thing I would do is just encourage them that it's okay to not be okay. Mm -hmm. Like, it's okay to be down for a little bit. The reason a mountain has peaks is because it has valleys. Mm -hmm. If there were no valleys, then everything would just seem like flat and level ground. Mm -hmm. So the valley is actually what dictates the peak. Um, I would also say that your time is coming but you too have to make your time come. They say luck is when preparation meets opportunity. You can't win the lotto unless you buy a ticket. <laughs> so you can sit there and hope and pray all you want to win the lotto, but you can't win the lottery unless you buy a ticket. So are mm -hmm. you buying tickets? I could hope and pray all I want and wish to change the world, but it was sitting down in front of the camera that led to uncomfortable conversations. It took action. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now, everyone who I've ever interviewed um, loves the high moments in life, but that's not obviously where they learn anything. They learn things on their on their deepest valleys what was your deepest valley my deepest valley oh gosh okay um remember i was in philadelphia i was drafted to the cleveland browns in 2012 in 2013 the philadelphia eagles they traded for me i was now in philadelphia but remember i told y'all i was cut five times by that organization one of the final times i got cut and what people don't realize about the national football league when you get cut they instantly remove your access from the building. You can no longer go into the building for anything, from a Gatorade shake to a workout to anything. I lived in Philadelphia. I lived very close to the Rocky Steps, but I still wanted to continue playing. So true story. After I got cut, I believe it was the second to last time, 
I would have to go to an abandoned field to work out. I showed up one day and the field is covered in nothing but pigeons. I didn't have bags. In, in football, you need a bags about five feet long and one foot high to just do different drills over. You might need to hop over the bag. You might need to sprint in front of a bag, then backpedal behind another one. Just do different uh, drills. I didn't have bags, so I had to steal street cones, construction orange street cones. So now imagine, I used to be this NFL player on Monday, but on Tuesday, I'm in an abandoned field, shooing pigeons off of the field, stealing construction cones, laying these construction cones on this field that has, was once overrun by pigeons, and I'm working out by myself, knowing that 20 minutes across town, all of my teammates and my best friends are there. Those were the lowest moments of my life. Man, I kept it up until I got another call, and the Eagles called me back, and they signed me again. But then I broke my thumb uh, and after I broke my thumb, I'm having surgery and I knew I knew one of two things. If they had to put pins in my thumb, the Eagles were going to release me because if they put pins in my thumb, I could not play because pins protrude from the skin. So you can't put a bandage on it and play with it. If they put screws in my thumb, I could still play because with screws, you could put a club on your hand and still play. So immediately after my surgery operation, I wake up and I look at the doctor and all I ask him is, pins or screws because if I if he says pins the Eagles were going to release me for the final time if he says screws then I am still going to be employed I wake up still partially sedated and I just say pins or screws and he says pins um, I start weeping I go to the Eagles facility the general manager meets me at the front door and he says hey Emmanuel coach wants to see you bring your playbook that means you're getting released with my left hand, I now have to pack up my locker for the final time. I have a huge trash bag with tears down my eyes and my hand casted. And for the final time, I left the Philadelphia Eagles facility. It, funny enough, and interestingly enough, for those interested in that story, I lead the book, Illogical. The chapter starts yeah. with pins and screws. Um, pins and so the and very screws. first... The very I first like, chapter is pinned to I screws. feel like God was busy trying to tell you all along that it was time to say goodbye to football, but you go. just wouldn't li You weren't <laughs> listening. Remember you said you got to listen? You were like this, not yet. I need pins or screws. I need oh, to get down to the end. My, I need my was, five times. It was terrible. I but, was like but truly, does, truly terrible. But that does, Emmanuel, bring you to that thing, which, again, I keep going back to, which is how do you know if God's trying to tell you to work harder which is what you were doing all those five times with the, or how do you know if he's trying to tell you pivot time yeah. to pivot now? How do you know when it's time? I think when you have exhausted your emotional, your financial uh, and your spiritual bandwidth. And it's like, you know what, unless this works and if this is not blessed, I am going to move on. You know, just back to your book for a minute, illogical. Um, what do you hope that people I know there's a lot of great life lessons in there, and I don't even know where to begin with them, quite frankly, because every time I turned a page, I was like, highlighter, highlighter, but there, it's got really good original ideas. But give me a couple that you think that people would like to take away. Along your illogical journey, so many people are going to tell you what you can't do instead of what you can do, mm -hmm. and you are going to need to block out that noise, so do not ever forget your earmuffs so on your destiny towards being the best version of yourself and living the life of your dreams you're going to have a might be crazy moment we already discussed that first drop of rain moment when you are being illogical there's going to come a point in time when you have and you experience that first drop of rain which tells you your your your, your success is coming true story in sixth grade, I was at my friend's house and we were eating burgers. His older brother walked in and he threw something at the table. My dear friend ran from the table and started hiding behind a chair. I was like, what in God's name is going on? I looked at what his older brother threw at the table and it was simply a pack ketchup packet. I cracked it open after checking up my friend and I started eating my fries with some ketchup. At that point in time, I learned a valuable lesson that day, Hoda. Don't be afraid of other people's fears. Ooh, don't be that's afraid good. of other people's fears. And so many of us in life are afraid of other people's fears. Well, well, I'm not going to start a business because my friend was afraid to. 
Yeah. I'm not going to get in a relationship because my homegirl got cheated on. I'm not going to get married because my, 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 my dad and my mom have never had, I've never seen a successful relationship. I can't leave this city. Nobody in my family has never ever left Austin, Texas. Why would I leave? I refuse to fly in an airplane because so-and-so is afraid of flying on an air. We're so afraid of other people's fears, not even our own. It's the craziest thing. That We're not even afraid brilliant. of our own fears. The book is called Illogical. It's by Emmanuel Acho. He's got great conversations. You can find him everywhere. You're making your mark. Look <laughs> at you. You're blazing your trail. Get out of your way. Thank you, my friend. Emmanuel, thank you. It was, a, it was wonderful talking to you. I enjoyed every second. Likewise. Welcome to Today All Day. All Day? Today All Day. All Day. This is a long oh, way of asking, yeah, who's your okay. favorite character you've ever played? Right. The unicorn. The unicorn. you got to have the unicorn. <laughs> what is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. I don't want the rap of Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cut. Cold Cut. Today, all day. All day? All day. Welcome to Today, All Day. Thanks for doing this, Jess. Good thank, to see you. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for making it all the way out here. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for having us. Ten years, that's no joke. Happy 10th birthday. Thank you, thank you. When I say 10 years, yes. what does that sound like to you? It sounds like not very long when you have children, right? Because you think of that like 10-year-old kid and or yourself as a 10-year-old. But when you're an entrepreneur, 10 feels like 100 years. <laughs> it's, it's like dog days, man. You're like, oh, every day feels so long. It's, uh, it's cool though. I learned a lot about myself in this process, on this journey. Every day is different. Every day I'm learning. Every day I'm uncomfortable, but I do. I do love where we are today and what we've been able to accomplish. And you know, when we started 10 years ago, consumers, everyday people didn't know that they could take their health into their own hands. They didn't know that they could demand more from companies. They didn't know that you know, there can be ethics and standards that they live by applied to businesses that they decide to spend their hard-earned money on. And that is something that I'm really proud of. You have to care about the planet and you have to think about how your ingredients or your products affect human health. What were you seeing out there that made you think we've got to change this? So when I became a mom and I was pregnant, I used products that my mother recommended for me to use and I had an allergic reaction myself and it just really made me think through health and wellness differently. I grew up very sick as a kid. I think it's why I became an actor when I was young because I spent a lot of time alone and in hospital rooms and I had complications with asthma and allergies, terrible. And so I was just thinking about as I was becoming a new mom and I was like, I gotta keep this little person alive and I just want her to be happy and healthy. Like there's really nothing else that matters. And I was afraid that she could have an allergic reaction. What could I do for her? What if her throat was closing and she's an infant? She couldn't even tell me because she's a baby. And I was terrified about that possibility. And so I did research and I learned about harmful chemicals, toxic chemicals that are in everyday products. And so I lobbied on Capitol Hill for chemical reform a couple of times. And I just realized that human health was really politicized in this country. And so I was like, all right, well, I guess I can create the solution. And I spent, you know, so much of my life selling movies and, you know, different products for different companies. And so I felt I knew how to reach the consumer in a genuine way. And so that's really where my mission and purpose came from, to create a company that has safety at the heart of it around health and wellness and thinks about the planet 
and people. And so I didn't have a business degree. I was super insecure. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I had to really like believe in myself first. And that's been a journey. I've had imposter syndrome and I've felt unworthy and all those things. But at the end of the day, what keeps me moving is when people say, by having Honest in our home, you've made my life better. It's such a leap to say, okay, so there's something wrong here. A lot of us have that somewhere in our lives and say, I'm going to be the one to do something about it. How did you have the guts to, to make that leap and to say, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to be the one? Well, two things. One. There's no nepotism for me in entertainment. So no one was rolling out the red carpet for me to be a successful <laughs> actress. In fact, everyone was like, yeah, right. <laughs> Good luck with that one. And so I think the fact that I figured out how to make a career for myself in entertainment when there was nobody that looked like me, and frankly, I didn't really ever play into the stigmas or the stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And so I was really kind of rebellious in my spirit and how I wanted to show up as an actress and I think that same rebellious spirit is what I brought to the table when I was thinking about how I was going to get this done and create this company. It just made sense. It just felt like I can't believe there isn't a company that that's called The Honest Company and, and that stands for these values. Is it a hard decision though to walk away? At least temporarily, of course, you're still acting. But yeah, to say, this I is going to be I, my focus now? It was my focus. You know, what's interesting is like, first of all, I think because I didn't grow up with a lot, I was never really that flashing. I wasn't um, overspending. <laughs> I was really quite conservative. So I felt comfortable with my financial situation. So I felt comfortable to pursue what I believed was my purpose. I was like, when I had my baby, she really shifted my the context of my life yeah. and my priorities. And I really just thought about my life choices and purpose and legacy differently. And I couldn't do anything else. I guess that drive was so intense mm -hmm. and so real. Here you talk about your insecurities and your imposter syndrome, which we all have all the time, of course. But you know that there are people who are like, oh, she's a movie star. What does she know about this? How is she going to run a company? Yeah, there's all, a lot of that. All of those <laughs> things. All of those things. <laughs> and you, you heard all those things. Uh, yeah, I did. Did it get to you at any point? Or were you so focused on this that you just sure. shut it out? Of course it does. I think a lot of the naysayers, they drove me in a way. It was almost like putting fuel on, on the fire. And also, like, when you come from people having zero expectations of who you could be there's a fearlessness you can only kind of go up from there mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah so the the growth of the company over time is was huge right I mean like you went from okay here's a spark in, of an idea mm -hmm. people responded very quickly mm -hmm. how did you guys sort of manage the pace of growth and success that I you mean, were experiencing that's, yeah that's sort of the learning right it's it's learning what is a healthy pace of growth and it's this game, right, of you st staying true to who you are and, and what you believe in. It's a really difficult lesson to learn when you're in it, but once you're out the other side, I think that's why I'm so passionate about mentoring uh, other entrepreneurs, especially women, Then I think trusting your gut on what to do. And then the harder part, actually, for me is then aligning a team around me that feels the same way. And it feels like, too, you're talking about the ups and downs of the mm -hmm. 10 years. You can't get complacent, right? You no. can't say, we've figured it out. You're never comfortable. We cracked the code. No, there's no cracking of the code. It's almost like every challenge, which now I look at as lesson, is really there to prepare you for the next stage. And if you can just I guess sort of welcome them as lessons instead of them sort of like weighing you down, then those are the entrepreneurs that you see them. You see them, you know, there's last man standing. They figure it out, they go with the flow, their business models change, they are malleable, um, they're relevant. Talk about being a mentor to other women and Latino women who are mm -hmm. starting companies. Who were those people for you on the front side? In 2011 and when all this was incubating. I'm not someone who speaks to strangers in the elevator. Like I'm a naturally kind of shy person 
and I have learned how to be a public facing person. Um, I play characters because I like to be somebody else. Yeah, I had to learn how to get out of my comfort zone and reach out to people, and I did. So I would reach out to pretty much any woman I would meet, even like when I would do sales meetings and meet executives um, in retail and in other places, go to conferences, and if I connected with someone, I would just say, can I call you? Mm. <laughs> and then I would, and I would say, have you ever dealt with this or that? Because I guess no one really tells you what you're gonna end up facing and where the challenges are really gonna lie. And you know, you can have a great idea. Getting people behind that idea is the hard part. Were there crazy pinch me moments along the way? I'm thinking of, for example, when you were on the cover of Forbes magazine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It was pretty wild. <laughs> Getting people to be aware of something that was so important to me that this message is spread and that people know that they can, more importantly, companies have to do better and that people can demand more. That was sort of like the validation that this idea is really for everyone. You went public a year ago. Happy one year anniversary of that. Thank you. How amazing was that to stand at the NASDAQ that day? It's still surreal to think about that. You know, so few women ever even get a chance at being there and being in that space and in that environment. I want all women out there to know that there's plenty of room at this table. It's crazy. Just having you know women and then even less when you think of women of color. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's just there's so few of us, so it is wild when you get a chance to be there and I guess have even more conviction around just how necessary it is to make space for others and just to make sure that that door that you pushed open never closes. What would you say to somebody who wants to chase the idea but is trying to kind of summon the courage to do it? You just have to, and I think instead of being discouraged by feedback, you have to be relentless and you're only going through that challenge to make you better so that you can hone in on your idea. It's worth the leap. Take a shot. Yeah, you have to. For women, we are half the population. We have half of the ideas. We make all the buying decisions, you know, not all of them, but a lot of them. Why are we still left out of the business world? And there's a lot of group think nothing good comes out of that. <laughs> mm. No good ideas. Right. It's only the, the ones that are provocative and polarizing that actually change the world. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. So this is the room where it happens, huh? You know, a lot of thinking happens in here. I like more of a community, so we have a ta I have a table there, and then, um, yeah, we can share screen and still do all of the like business updates and things, but uh, it's a more flexible kind of space. That was the first thing I noticed. There's no big desk. Like, the CEO sits here. Yeah, It's no. like, come on in, sit down. Yeah, my CEO has a desk, but I'm, you know. <laughs> the I boss. I, You're the boss. <laughs> you know. 
Yeah, and to think of how far you've come in those 10 years. My goodness. From an idea that some people might have thought was crazy. So many people. So <laughs> many people thought was really nuts um, for like a good three years until I convinced somebody to invest some money <laughs> into the idea. Yeah. And then that was cool. You stayed with it. And look I at did. you now. I did. All right, should we walk around? Yeah, again? let's right. uh, let's walk around. I like the sort of open vibe in here, too. It's not yeah. like the closed cubicle. It's people yeah. collaborating in open space. It is. You get a lot more done when you don't have to like set up formal meetings. And yeah. you can just overhear conversations. And um, it's much more like, I think, modern. Yeah. That like community. Yes. Do you want to see the labs? Can this we go is like in there? one of the, I think, the things that make oh, wow. us really special because we have such a stringent quality and safety standard, the honest standard, we um, really, it's kind of like the base of, of what we do and who we are. So having labs where we could actually formulate is incredible. And it's also where I get to have fun and be creative. <laughs> Hi, ladies. Hi, guys. How are you? Mind if we poke our heads in? Yeah, come on in. How's it going? So this is fun. We have... Um... I'm Willie. Nice to, nice to meet you. Hi. Hi, how are you? So this is cool. So this is how when you're going to do a color for a lip, you really have to like mush all the ingredients together or else there's like lumps and you don't right. really know like what color it will be. So whenever we're coming up with a new color, we can even do custom colors in here. And then this will be sort of the base that we work from and then we'll send to our lab to make it at scale. Okay. But um, I get to play in here and like create colors and it's really cool. That's so fun. And like even my kids can come in and create their own lotions or shampoos with their own scents and yeah. It's fun to come see mom at work. Yeah, and also like I want them to be excited about science yeah. and chemistry. And what's cooler than having the coolest chemist than to so inspire cool. two young girls. <laughs> we'll let All you right. work. Thank you yeah. guys. Nice to meet you both. All right. This is the infamous diaper wall. It's so <laughs> random. I don't know. There's something kind of cool about just the idea that we have a wall with like all of our prints. These, and oh my it, gosh. you know, we made over the years so many that it's not come around to here. That's amazing. <laughs> and I'm like, it also reminds me of like where I was at in my life <laughs> for really? the last 10 years. <laughs> Each print, you know, represents different stages of life. So this wasn't here. Okay. These were all solid floors. Ah, and so this is what I had it. to, yeah, gotcha. build out with the architect. And, you know, I was like, I want it to be warm. Is it cool of you to think there's a mother somewhere right now changing their baby's diaper <laughs> to that one or that one or that yeah. one? I mean, the things you guys think of in these rooms. I love it. people's homes. Yeah, I mean, even, like... We wanted to have real people and their um, children on our packaging. So these aren't from photo shoots. These are from real people who take these pictures of their babies in these like most special intimate moments at home. And that's what we put on our packaging. It just feels more natural, more authentic. Yeah, right. and, and that's like a friend that works here. That's her best friend. So I do like to do a lot of friends and family. Yeah, yeah. Um, they must be so proud of you, your family, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, this it's is a big pretty deal. cool. We don't test on animals, we test on human beings, and they're usually related to me. Mostly family members. <laughs> Mostly right. family members. So when I got this space, there were no doors here, and this was all air conditioning units, and this was supposed to be a wall. And I was like, well, I really think it's important to have the indoor-outdoor vibes. I think it just makes for a happier environment yeah. for people. So really homey vibes inside. And then even out here, we have plugs. Uh, we have great Wi-Fi. We have plants. Um, people have lunch out here. And it's just like a nice sort of break from the day. So when you look out over the horizon yeah. for your company, what do you see? What's out there in the future? What else do you want to do with it? We have a lot of growing to do and learning and changing and challenging. I think you know our biggest competition is ourselves. And we're just always trying to push the envelope to do better. And that's what I'm hoping we stay inspired to do that. You're doing it. So. Cool. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now.
cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. What do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You were talking about your childhood, and I didn't realize until I was reading more deeply about you before this, like everything you went through as a kid that kind of colors your perception of what you do here. Mm -hmm. um, not only were you moving around a bunch because mm -hmm. your dad was in the military, mm -hmm. but as you said, you were in the hospital all the yeah. time. I don't think most people fully appreciate what that was like for you. Yeah, I was a loner and had more interactions with adults just because, you know, the nurses or whatever. Mm. Yeah, I was probably kind of precocious as well because I didn't have the same ideas about myself or my place in the world as other kids because I didn't have a conventional kind of upbringing. Yeah, I felt very alien mm. in many environments. And I think that's why when I did make it on a set when I was 12, we were all eccentric and, you know, everyone was sort of like, diagonal. No one was on the straight and narrow. And no one cared about fitting in. You found your people. I found my people. Yeah, <laughs> but your family had entertainers as well. They were right? performers, but um, my grandfather was a bookkeeper, accountant for a big corporation. You know, so he had a pretty traditional sort of job, but he played beautiful Spanish classical guitar and he sang and danced on stage with my grandmother. We have like a very artistic family, but no one had done it as a career. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. How do you make that step from this is a thing we do as a family, and I'm pretty good at it, actually, and I like doing it, I too. wasn't good at it. No, I was the least talented. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. No, I was, I was shy, too. Yeah, I wouldn't even put myself out there. I dreamt about it a lot. I mean, I love movies. I would play out as if I were each character, all the characters and I would put myself in their shoes and escape from my life, you know? And once you got going, you really got going. When James Cameron puts you front and center mm -hmm. in a network series at 17 years yeah. old, mm -hmm. that's a lot. You had to carry the series. He was series. like, Ace, <laughs> they think you're gonna get your ass handed to you. He's like, these guys, they think that you're not gonna be able to like deal with the pressure, deal with the long hours, do your own stunts. He's like, what do you say to that? And I was like, Tell them to go screw themselves. <laughs> I can do this. <laughs> and he was like, that's right. I believe in you, Ace. And he would always call me Ace. That was his motivational speech. Yeah, I think also, like, they were probably like, the 17-year-old girl came from who? Came from mm -hmm. where? Like, right. what if she, like, falls apart? Like, there's a lot riding on this. And it was a big show at the time. And it was expensive. I wasn't allowed to have a sick day. I remember I had pneumonia or the flu or something something they gave made me so sick that I couldn't get out of bed and the producer came over and he was like I came to get you because insurance and I puked on his feet um, <laughs> I crawled to the door I opened the door and I barfed on his feet 
And I was like, I can't. Yeah, I mean, that's how tough it was. I was in every scene, and it was long days and, and long hours. Kid. And I was a kid. Yeah. And I don't know any kid that would had that work ethic. And so it taught me actually a lot. It was one of my greatest lessons just on like showing up and yes. hard work. I was like the first to get there and the last to leave. So what's the role where your life really changes? Is it honey? Is it Dark like, Angel okay. did well, Dark really Angel. changed my yeah. life. And then maybe the Fantastic Four yeah. series because first of all, there weren't very many female superheroes yep. and I was Latina and playing an iconic character. Um, and Stanley says that was his favorite character. Oh, really? Yeah, he loved her. That was probably a turning point for me because I got to sort of like capitalize on the global audience that I had built with Dark Angel and lean in on that for the big screen. Hmm. And so it really kind of like took it to that next level. As you say, as someone who didn't grow up in like a showbiz family, how did you handle the fame side of it? I think it's hard. I don't know if anyone could ever really be prepared for it, um, living in a fishbowl. When I had my kids, I didn't want them to carry the anxiety mm. that comes with that. I mean, I lied to them, and I told them that everybody gets followed by strangers. And it wasn't until like my daughter was like in second grade <laughs> that she realized that. Uh, she was like, Mom, why are you? on the cover of a magazine. She, she was like, it was it. so embarrassing. <laughs> Someone like brought it to school. And I was like, yeah. And she's like, why, why? It's, why are you doing this? And I was like, ugh. Cat's out of the bag. Yeah, but she wasn't, I don't think she really realized that honest wasn't my only job. Right. Because I never exposed them to it. Right. I don't like have pictures of myself around and I don't talk about it. And so they lived a pretty kind of like sheltered-ish life yeah. about it. And do you, you guys, you and Cash, it seems like have worked hard to sort of keep that as normal as it can be. As normal as it can be. It's not normal, it's no. weird. And I try to talk to my kids about like how fortunate we are. Um, and there are so many people who, you know, are struggling and, and how grateful they need to be for their life. So then they don't get too caught up in any of it either feeling sorry for themselves because they live in a fishbowl, and then on the flip side, just being grateful for their life so they can just be kind and generous people. Welcome back to you today. We got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? So as you move forward, how are you going to look at this balance that you've struck the last 10 years of honest and your acting career? You've got some stuff booked that's coming up, also yeah. executive producer of a new yeah. series on Netflix. How are you looking at that? Producing is something that I've always wanted to do, and I think more doing more behind the camera is really exciting as well. And then I feel like I just barely scratched the surface from a creative standpoint for myself as an actress. I kind of just wanted the check to clear, to be honest. I was pretty mm. transactional with Hollywood. I was like, will it pay? 
Is it going to be a global thing? Is it going to keep me in this sort of like relevant space for a global audience? But it wasn't me fulfilling my creative kind of needs. So now I'm like, I have a lot more confidence as well. I was really insecure. And I think mm -hmm. I kept it pretty surface because I was like, you know, I'm just going to hit my mark and I'm going to show up on time and right. I'm going to be professional and I, it's going to fulfill this purpose. But now I'm, you know, I'm excited about exploring more in Hollywood and entertainment and telling stories and there's so many different platforms now so there's a lot less I think weight on uh, your opening weekend like it used to be. Right. I love how many women get to be you know behind the camera in front of the camera telling stories and the diversity of the streamers and and where content can be made and it's it's awesome. It's interesting. You almost can kind of like relaunch yourself. Like you've been doing this for ten years, and here she comes back to Hollywood, and she's directing or producing or taking yeah. on new kinds of roles. So yeah, it's exciting. I mean, after COVID, man, I'm very grateful to be here. Yeah. And not like it's gone away, but I think just reflecting on the last couple of years, if we get to wake up and and be here then let's do everything we can to make it joy, just pure joy <laughs> and fun and happiness. Amen you know. to that. Yeah. Well, thank you for hosting us. Congrats on 10 years. Thank you. Here's to many, many more. Thank you Thanks, so much. Thanks, Jessica. A big hello and thanks for joining us for a special edition of Pop Start Plus. I'm Joe Fryer filling in for Carson. Today on the show, we're taking a moment to indulge in the past and revisit our favorite nostalgic summer movies. We're going to take a look at why we feel the way we do when we watch those older summer flicks. And you're killing me, Smalls. Today, contributor Donna Farrison spoke to the cast of a movie that defines the season, The Sandlot. We found out why it still resonates today. And to close out our special show, we've got our friend Chris Witherspoon, founder and CEO of Pop Viewers. He's counting down the most nostalgic summer movie scenes of all time. Stay with us for all of that. It'll be great. To kick things off, here's a deep dive into how watching nostalgic films makes us feel, especially during the heat of summer. Summer in itself is a great example of a trigger for nostalgia because it connotes many of the attributes that accompany nostalgia, such as longing for the carefreeness, the leisure uh, of childhood. But when you watch something like a movie that's set at summer camp, you've got so many stimuli there that are reminding us that in our hectic, busy lives, should we not occasionally take a break? So, uh, either of you by any chance know how to play poker? Yeah, never played it before. Roosevelt, how's that lanyard coming? Horrible. Film is a really good example of a medium that has all of the triggers for different kinds of sensory experiences, visual, auditory, such as the music in a film. And so you have all these varieties of sensory stimuli that help you to mentally transport yourself in two ways, by the way. Uh, one, when you're just remembering the past, you're transporting yourself back to that time. An interesting finding recently showed that when people just reminisce nostalgically, they even feel a little more uh, healthy and vibrant and they have more vitality. Why? Because when you transport yourself back, you're feeling a little bit of the feelings you felt when you were younger. Nostalgic films, especially for uh, looking back to your beloved favorite uh, childhood movies, those were a source of great comfort. Shut up! You're killing me, Smalls. Dear Darla, I hate your stinking guts. <laughs> Their time! Up there! Down here, it's our time! It's our time down here! In fact, in film, for example, we believe from the research data that there are characters in movies that serve as surrogates for us. So when you watch a film that you loved in the past, not only are you remembering 
when you watched it, with whom did you watch it, the, the uh, conversations you had at the time, maybe you went out to the movies with friends or what have you. But in addition to that, as you watch characters in films play out their own problems and resolve them through this vicarious resolution, you feel that hope and optimism which is a lot like the happy ending of many stories that we've seen throughout our lives, right? If you wanted to uh, log them according to seasons of the year, for instance, summer is a great time. And uh, what operates as a nostalgic film, it could be something like Star Wars, uh, episode one, for a generation who saw that for the first time, either as children, teenagers, or young adults, and to some extent, it's transporting them, not just to the film and the enjoyment of the film, but also uh, it gives someone the ability to reflect upon, what did it mean to me when I saw that as a kid? And now what, did, what would I think of it now? So sometimes when we rewatch an old film, we're comparing our understanding as full-fledged adults or our understanding now, now that we've lived through so much with what we thought when we first saw it. Also for the elderly today, they might think back to the great summer films that were beach movies. You know, the parties on the beach and playing volleyball on the beach. When you think about transportation uh, mentally through a film, now you have added on to it that you might transport yourself to somebody else's past or to somebody else's experience, not necessarily your own. So uh, fiction can be enjoyed and benefited from even in terms of nostalgia for instance a lot of nostalgic films incorporate within the plot or within the character uh, lines characters remembering back to their past i can still recall our last summer i still see it all walks along the seine laughing in the rain I was the last one to move away, but when I did, the Sandlot was still there. And then when you watch that, then that prompts you to sort of mentally transport yourself with that character back to their past as well. So it's very rich. Film is a very rich medium. Our thanks to Professor Christine Batchel for sharing all of her findings and insights with us, a little better understanding of why those films make us feel so good. Still to come, even more nostalgia and more fun. Donna Farrison's chat with the Sandlot stars who played Yaya and Squints. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? What do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to our Pop Start Plus special all about nostalgic summer movies. Now, if you're a 90s kid, you'll remember the 1993 release of a movie about a ragtag pack who loved playing ball. And it changed how we think about summer forever. Today, contributor Donna Farrison spoke to two of the stars from The Sandlot, Chauncey Leopardi, who played Squints, and Marty York, who played Yeah Yeah. They shared the responses they still get about the movie set during a summer back in 1962.
Was the summer you filmed The Sandlot the best summer of your lives? It was for sure the best summer <laughs> of my life. Yeah, yeah. I don't think anything, you know, compares to it since then. And uh, I think we just had, had a blast. It was summer camp for like two or three months that we filmed over the summer and definitely, definitely the best. Yeah, it was pretty great. It's hard to beat. Um, obviously, you know, I love my family and I wouldn't want my wife to think that, uh, you know, my 11 year old summer was the best summer of my life. But uh, it, it, it was pretty awesome, you know, hanging out with friends and having that experience and then getting to share it with uh, the rest of the world forever. It's just a, it's a pretty, a pretty amazing thing. This film represents the best of summer, the 4th of July celebrations, the carnival, kids playing ball, the s'mores, you name it. There's so many different elements. Why do you think The Sandlot is a film that has defined summertime for a lot of people? It takes people back to a, to an era of the United States that where kids went outside and they played and when the sun went down, that's when they came, went home. I want you to get out into the fresh air and make some friends. Run around, scrape your knees, get dirty. You had adventures during the day. It'll be 30 years next year, first of all. How does that feel for you guys? It's amazing. I mean, you know, anytime you do a film, you never know what the results are gonna be. But to still be here talking about this 30 years later and to, uh, to see it still affecting people's lives for the better is kind of, that's kind of why you're in the arts, you know? It's the, the reason that you want to do, that's what you set out when you, you have passion about a project, is to hope that you get one that, that you know, changes things, you know, forevermore. So, it, it's a blessing. And we, uh, we appreciate all the love and support that we've gotten over the years. What were your favorite scenes to film for each of your characters? I loved like all of the baseball stuff, obviously it was a lot of fun. When we played the other team, it was a blast. Filming the whole chase scene, we did that for like two weeks. So just the dog chasing Benny and all the different stuff. And that was a lot of fun as well. I think that there's like something to find that was cool about everything. And uh, even in the treehouse stuff, that treehouse was amazing. This is when they really built sets for film still. There was no green screens or, or you know, or anything like that. So that was all like real craftsmanship. Somebody, a carpenter, the the uh, the construction guys on set actually built those sets. So they were so cool and like so in depth, uh, Mr. Myrtle's house. And it was a really cool time in filmmaking because you still had all of the crafts really showing, you know, showcasing their work. Whereas now maybe things are a little bit more reliant on, on computer generated software and, and stuff like that. So it was a cool time to, to kind of see them you know, fabricate this uh, this really cool film and uh, these really cool sets. Obviously, my my favorite scene was going over the fence to come face to face with the beast and uh, being on that crane. And it's really cool because you know back then, you know, kids could do their own stunts, which would never happen nowadays. And just like a lot of the stuff that I didn't even see till the final picture came out, the Fourth of July scene, you know. We filmed that with just literally lights and gels that they put in front to make it look like fireworks were going off. You know, when we filmed that, it didn't seem that iconic to me until you put Ray Charles to it, until you put the, the fireworks in the sky. And uh, you, when we saw the final product, we were like, wow, like that really like, you know, that's an amazing scene. That was just movie magic. God done shed his grace on thee. What kind of memories do people you know, tell you that they have that are related to the Sandlot. What do the fans come up to you and say? Everybody that relates to Squints that has the glasses or like, you know, I get a lot of the pictures and the photos. Sometimes as growing up, having glasses is always like a, you know, something that people could be a little reserved about or, or feel like they get picked on a little bit. So it's cool to have that that cool character that people can relate to that, that makes them feel um, like this is a, a superpower, not, not not the opposite. How do you think the Sandlot has helped empower young people to feel more included, be more inclusive, and you know, feel okay to embrace their differences? It's awesome because this is a bunch of uh, kids of all shapes, colors, and sizes. They're all different. They all have their own little their little thing. And you know, the main character is a kid that's filling out a place and Andrew coming from somewhere else and really not fitting in. And it starts off with so like his struggle of like you know, trying to connect with his stepfather and trying to connect with these kids in this well, new neighborhood. And uh, it takes a guy like Benny, who is obviously a, a very strong character and an amazing baseball player, 
and uh, a total star to just no, say, you know, leave him alone. We need an extra guy, and this guy's this guy's gonna be it. You know, so it's about including people, regardless of you know what the the masses feel. So I think it has a lot to say about you know real American values because that's what America is. It's a melting pot of different cultures and different people that that you know find common ground to create a better life for themselves. Really cool to hear from those two. We're going to share more from them after the break, including what it was like to film that famous pool scene featuring squints and Wendy Peppercorn. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate <laughs> on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. <laughs> To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. What do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to our special episode of Pop Start Plus. Let's pick back up with Donna Farrison's conversation with two stars from The Sandlot, Marty York and Chauncey Leopardi, who spoke about that very pivotal pool scene and the impact it's had on young kids today. Chauncey, you were talking about, you know, Wendy Peppercorn and that pool scene, which is so iconic when your character almost drowns and then gets saved by the lifeguard that everyone has a crush on. What do you remember from shooting that scene? God, he looks like a dead fish. Uh, it was really cold. Mm -hmm. It was uh, it was a really hot summer, but uh during the time that we shot the pool scene, it had dipped down into like the 70s and we were shooting early mornings for the light and uh, it was freezing cold. So in a lot of those scenes, you can see us like shivering in the pool. Or I know it was like a big anticipation for me leading up to that. I kept asking the director, you know, is today the day, is today the day? <laughs> you know what I mean? It was my first, my first kissing scene. So, you know, wow. pretty exciting. That is exciting. That's amazing. Yeah. Just as we talked about earlier too, so much that has happened or the emotions that are evoked from the Sandlot translate into real life as well. On the Today Show, Hoda recently interviewed the three boys who had saved the dad who became unconscious underwater in their pool. It's an amazing story. They performed CPR on him, saved his life, and they credited learning CPR through watching the Sandlot and through that specific Scene. Now, who took a CPR class? Raise your hand. Nobody? But you did know, because what was one of your favorite movies? The Sandlot. What was your reaction to that news? That's just incredible. You know, like, here we are 30 years later, and, and something that someone saw that we did 30 years ago saved their father's life. I mean, it, it just, it, it makes you want to tear up because it's such a beautiful thing. And, uh, you know, wherever we get the information from, it, it, it's great, you know. So to be the the 
the force that helped them do that for their father, you know, I, I'll never forget it. Every time I come across a fan of the Sandlot, they always talk about it in a way that, you know, they feel so com comforted and cozy when watching it. It brings them back to a different time. Why do you think people feel so comforted when watching The Sandlot? It's timeless. The way David Mickey Evans, the writer and director, shot it, he told the DP, Tony Richmond, he told him, I want it to look like Kodak chromatic film. So that's like an old, uh, you know, very pop arty type of film from the from the 60s. And he said, I want it to look like that. And I think because of the setting, had he have done it in the 90s when we shot it and, and placed it present day, I don't think it would have lasted and stood the test of time. It's like a Bel Air, it's like a, a 57 Chevy, you know, it's something that the lines on it are gonna be clean forever. And no matter what, you're always gonna get a nostalgic feeling when you go see these these old cars at these car shows and just the storied time in American history. And be, and because it's it's just frozen in time, I think that it, it, it stands the test of time because it is a time capsule, like Marty said. It just, it takes you to a happy place where, you know, good or bad, we felt like everything was was a little bit simpler. Thank you to Marty and Chauncey for hanging out with us. Still to come, we've queued up some of the most nostalgic summer movie scenes of all time. Do we got any Parent Trap fans out there? Stick with us. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. What do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Welcome back to our special episode of Pop Start Plus. We are diving into everything you need to know about nostalgic summer movies. And who better to guide us along than Chris Witherspoon? He is the founder and CEO of Pop Viewers, and he's about to take us on a lovely trip down memory lane with some of the most nostalgic summer movie scenes ever. Is there anything that beats the warm weather, the long sun-filled days and fun that comes with summertime? Whether you went to camp or hung out by the pool, spent time with family and friends, or had seven jobs like me, summer was always filled with terrific memories of growing up. Unfortunately, we'll never be kids again, but luckily, we'll always have movies to turn to that transport us back to those days, no matter what decade you grew up in. Let's count down as we watch some of the best nostalgic summer movie scenes of all time. First up, Weekend at Bernie's. It's an absolute classic. Now grab your sunblock and flip flops because you'll be wanting to enjoy a weekend at the beach after watching this one. In it, Jonathan Silverman and Andrew McCarthy play friends who are invited for a weekend at their boss's opulent beach house. Lots of shenanigans ensue that ultimately lead to their boss, Bernie's, death. But to avoid ruining their weekend, Richard and Larry pretend he's still alive. Let's take a look at the clip. You're probably right. Get it together, Bernie. Oh, Bernie. Here we go. Should we move it over a little bit? Okay, baby. Asshole. I don't understand why we have to move him, Rich. Oh, don't ask me any questions, Larry. Just move him. Oh. Here we go. Ready? I can't believe I'm touching a dead body. Here's your boss. Come on. Let's go. Whoa. Oh, Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get her up. Oh, Bernie. You're always done. Come on. Yeah. That's what you call some dead weight. Come on, knucklehead. Come on. Let's go. Come on, he's crazy. Here we go. Wait, is there an award for playing the best dead guy? If so, Terry Kaiser deserves it. 
If you're looking to laugh like there's no tomorrow, add this film to your summer watch list. Next up, one of almost everyone's favorites, The Notebook. Ryan Gosling and Rachel McAdams killed these roles as lovers who were always meant to be together. Who could forget the moment when Noah and Allie reunited after seven years apart? Did he just pick that boat up with his bare hands? I think he did. It wasn't over for me. I waited for you for seven years. Now it's too late. I wrote you 365 letters. I wrote you every day for a year. You wrote me? Yes. It wasn't over. It still isn't over. That's a kiss right there. Ooh, talk about a hot girl summer. Even all that rain couldn't cool those two down. On to another fun one, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Now, if you watch this as a teen, then you got tons of ideas on how to spend the perfect day playing hooky. Matthew Broadwick stars, of course, as Ferris Bueller, and the movie starts a month before Ferris's high school graduation. Ferris ends up at a museum, a baseball game, a fancy restaurant, you name it. One of the most hilarious moments was when his teacher realizes he's missing from class. Let's watch this clip. Anderson. Here. Bueller. 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 Um, he's sick. My best friend's sister's boyfriend's brother's girlfriend heard from this guy who knows this kid is going with the girl who saw Ferris pass out at 31 Flavors last night. Now she can That's lie. That's pretty serious. That's a good lie. Thank you, Simone. No problem whatsoever. Fry. <laughs> oh my God. Ben Stein's boring monotone delivery gets me every time. And P.S. Find yourself a coworker that will be your alias next time you want to ditch work on a summer Friday. Everybody needs one of those. Now, Clueless is one of those timeless movies following a group of popular high school friends. If you didn't know, it's a modernization of Jane Austen's Emma, and it's got an amazing cast. Alicia Silverstone and Paul Rudd, and of course, the late, great Brittany Murphy. Just to name a few. Check out this scene where Cher, played by Silverstone, makes the case for not participating in PE class. Earth to Cher! Come in, Cher! Oh my God. Ms. Stoger? I would just like to say that physical education in this school is a disgrace. I mean, standing yes, in line for 40 minutes is hardly aerobically effective. I doubt I've worked off the calories in a stick of carefree gum. Come on, Cher. <laughs> I feel like in this scene, Cher could have just said, uh, as if, and been done with it. Clueless does take place throughout all four seasons, but real talk, those Beverly Hills vibes will have you feeling like you're on vacation. Another fun summer love story with lots of dancing. You guessed it, dirty dancing. Jennifer Grey and Patrick Swayze play Baby and Johnny, and the two fall in love after being paired as dance partners. Now, one of the most iconic movie lines ever came from the scene where Johnny proclaims his love for Baby before the movie's final epic dance performance. Let's watch. As the mountains stand, Nobody puts baby in a corner. Tell him. Sorry about the disruption, folks. But I always do the last dance of the season. But this year, somebody told me not to. So I'm going to do my kind of dancing with a great part. Sit down. Get about not only a terrific dancer. Dirty dance. Somebody who's taught me <laughs> that there are people willing to stand up for other people no matter what it costs them. Mmm. The best parts yet to come. I am declaring it now. Nobody puts baby in the corner is one of the most iconic movie lines of all time. Try to tell me it's not. Alas, if only all of our summers could end with a sultry summer dance routine. And next up, one of my favorites, Poetic Justice. Janet Jackson, Regina King, and Tupac Shakur gave legendary performances in this film. They play friends who road trip to Oakland, California, and basically fall in love along the way. Poetic Justice is another one of those films that will definitely have you crying and laughing, but I love this scene where the friends crash a random family barbecue. Let's take a look. I don't think so. My cousin, my that. cousin. Look at my family over here. My cousins. What's up, cousin? How you Hi, doing, boy? boy? 
cousin. What's up, cousin? What's up? Well, I ain't seen you and I don't know where. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Janet Jackson knows how to give a good stank face. And sometimes all you gotta say is cousin. And you guys, I'm pleading the fifth on if I've ever crashed a barbecue for a burger. Please don't judge me. And last, but certainly not least, I doubt you've ever gone a summer without watching this one, The Parent Trap. The remake stars Lindsay Lohan and tells the story of twin sisters who meet and realize they are really sisters at summer camp. The moment they see each other and realize how much they look alike is priceless. Let's take a look. <gasps> New camp champ, come on. <gasps> those freckles, those freckles, those freckles get me every time. Why is everyone staring? Can we have Kleenex see handy? See what? Please. I need them. This part us. gets me every time. Resemblance between you and me? Oh my god, every time that movie gets me! You know, I watched this movie so many times as a kid, and you couldn't tell me Lindsay Lohan didn't have a twin sister in real life. It's definitely one to add to the rotation, y'all. Okay, we just gave you a taste of a few surefire summer flicks. Now I know, we outside again, but with this summer heat, nothing beats a good old movie night. We hope you have a blast watching or re-watching some of our favorite picks. So many great recommendations. Our thanks to Chris for bringing them to us and for giving us all a boost with your terrific reactions. We should mention you can download the Pop Viewers app from the App Store. That was our Pop Star Plus Nostalgic Summer Movie Special here on Today All Day. Thank you for tuning in. Hope you had as much fun as we did revisiting some of our favorite films from the past. It's been a pleasure to bring them to you. Have a great day. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Today All Day. Actually, I don't even to say good morning because maybe you're watching it at night and that's the point. That's right. It's today all, all day. day. And this is our show today in 30, so it's Friday. It is. Okay, so we closed out the week with a huge, great show. And we did, we're going to start off today with new developments in the Brittany Griner saga. The U.S. and Russia set to discuss a prisoner swap after the WNBA and Olympic star was sentenced to nine years in a Russian prison. Andrea Mitch will have the latest. And then Vicki Wynn's going to be along. Everything we need to know about leasing a car. She's got tips to help you get what you want while you're navigating those record prices. Yeah, and in honor of the Coast Guard's 232nd birthday, Al set sail on the iconic Eagle. Wait till you see the inner workings of America's tall ship and its rich history. And guys, we wrap things up with a fun chat and concert from one of our favorites, mm -hmm. Hoda's absolute favorite, Walker Hayes. This is why we have the Oreo shakes. Where's because we're fancy like Applebee's, Applebee's on, on a date, date night. night. Where's the Bourbon Street steak? We'll have it after the Oreo okay. shake. All right, it's time and for Today in 30. 30. Guys, we're going to start with new developments just coming in this morning concerning Brittany Griner and a new movement toward a possible prisoner swap with Russia. That country's foreign minister saying overnight Russia is, quote, ready to discuss the topic. Secretary of State Antony Blinken responding a short time ago saying the U.S. will be, quote, pursuing it. Let's get right to NBC's chief foreign affairs correspondent Andrea Mitchell with the very latest. Andrea, good morning to you. Good morning, Savannah. Well, this is a case the administration says should never have gone forward. Griner sentenced after pleading guilty, admitting she had packed in a hurry, accidentally throwing cannabis oil vape cartridges less than a gram into her bag when she flew to Russia earlier this year. The Biden administration says it will continue to work around the clock until she and fellow detainee Paul Whelan are back on American soil. And overnight, a signal from the Russians they are willing to talk. Family. WNBA superstar Brittany Griner now staring down a lengthy sentence for drug possession and smuggling. Nine years in a Russian penal colony, just shy of the maximum, despite her pleas for leniency. I had no intent to break any Russian laws. I made an honest mistake, and I hope that in your ruling that it doesn't end my life here. I know everybody keeps talking about political pawn and politics, but I hope that that is far from this courtroom. Back home, her team, the Phoenix Mercury, pausing for a moment of silence before the tip-off Thursday night. Fans responding with shouts of, bring her home. 
The focus of her fate could lie in Cambodia, where Secretary of State Antony Blinken and his Russian counterpart Sergei Lavrov are at a security forum. Overnight, Lavrov saying Moscow was open to further talks on a prisoner swap. Blinken responding. They are prepared to engage through channels we've established to do just that, and we'll be pursuing that. Caged in the courtroom, Griner also speaking directly to her fans in Russia, where she plays in the off-season. I want to apologize to my teammates, my club, Gemka, the fans in the city of Ekat, for my mistake that I made and the embarrassment that I brought onto them. President Biden calling on Russia to release her immediately so she can be with her wife, loved ones, friends and teammates. I couldn't imagine being in that situation, and, and she was so courageous. The president has approved a proposal to trade convicted Russian arms dealer Victor Boot for Griner and Paul Whelan, an American businessman who's already spent four years in a Russian jail. It's a, a, not a great environment, and I think he just needs to focus on the day-to-day -day survival. Russia's counteroffer, along with Boot, sent home Vadim Krasikov, a Russian spy jailed in Germany for murder. What do you think was going on there? We think this is a bad faith attempt by the Russians, uh, knowing that it's not a serious counteroffer, uh, just to cloud up the water. Griner's team plans to appeal the decision, which they say is absolutely unreasonable. Now the question, is Vladimir Putin ready to make a deal for Griner and the jailed American businessman? Savannah? All right, Andrea, thank you. All right, we're back. Today's Consumer Confidential, our series exploring the many things that are impacting those wallets these days. Yeah, it's been one roadblock after another for car buyers recently. And now, even an option that a lot of people turn to, which is leasing, is starting to get out of reach. Yeah, NBC's senior consumer investigative correspondent Vicki Wynn is here with a look at what's behind it and what you can do about it. Hey, Vic. Hey, good morning, Craig Hoda and Savannah. Leasing, it's a really popular short-term alternative to owning. Two years ago, prices were at rock bottom. Now, they're at record highs. You're finding fewer deals, but with a little planning and resilience, you can still drive off in the car of your dreams. Chip shortages, empty lots, and high demand, the formula adding up to record car prices. In July 2020, the average lease cost $466 a month. Two years later, and it's a record high, $594. That's a 27% increase. The average new car's monthly payment is $686. Experts say consider leasing instead of buying if you want a lower payment, you don't expect to put on a lot of mileage, and you like changing cars every few years. I love how small it is, and I love the gas mileage. Taylor Raps is a flight attendant in New York who needs her Honda Civic to get around. So back in August 2020, I got an amazing deal. It was $0 down for $250 a month. But with only one year left on her lease, she's already struggling with how to replace her car. What are you finding now when you go back into the market? I am finding $3,000 down for maybe $350 to $450 a month for the same car. And at the end of a lease, what would the price difference be? Right now at the end of my lease, I'm gonna um, have paid $9,000. And currently if I were to start another three-year lease, I will pay anywhere from 21 to $23,000. Ivan Drury is an analyst for Edmunds. The company crunches national sales data for consumers. When you go back to that environment of leasing, things just won't look the same. He says, don't expect dealer incentives. This is a seller's market. But if you are shopping, check manufacturer websites for monthly lease specials. They do exist. Be flexible on your make and model. Compare the dealer quote to prices on Edmunds and Kelly Blue Book to make sure it's in line with the market average. Most importantly, plan ahead at least three months in advance of when you need the car. Today, inventories are depleted. Cars are in transit. They're already spoken for. So number one, look ahead to the future. See what is available. And you might even need to order something before it even shows up at the dealerships. And one tried and true method. Can you negotiate at all in this environment? You might see asking prices that are five or $10,000 over MSRP. And again, those are asking prices. In some cases, you might end up having to pay those. I mean, some of that, you got to take the old adage of you don't ask, you don't get. Leases also come with interest, but it's called money factor. So be sure to ask the dealership to convert that number to an interest rate so you know what you're paying, especially with rates on the rise. Broadly speaking, are sedans or SUVs or trucks cheaper to lease? You know, honestly, there really isn't a great place to find relief. Even though we've seen that gas prices shot up, 
you would have expected that large trucks, large SUVs, their values to just plummet or suddenly there would become incentives involved. That's really not the case. Fortunately, if you're like Taylor and your lease is expiring, you may be in a good position, especially if you trade in your car early because it's almost certainly worth more than it was a few years ago. So, so Vic, what's the best advice for folks who mm -hmm. are in the car mar market right now? Should we buy now? Mm -hmm. Should we wait wait later? Prices starting to come down? Well, if you're buying now, you absolutely need to shop around like we talked about. Each dealer will have different incentives, mm -hmm. and you, you can pit them against each other. Um, if you are going to wait, you're going to wait about a year to 18 months. As wow. he says, it's going to take about that long, but they feel pretty good that things will normalize in the next 12 to 18 months. So if you can wait, absolutely, you'll get a better price. But if you need one right now, shop around. And year, shop early. Half? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you, Vicky. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. This is a critical turn point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? In honor of the Coast Guard turning 232 mm -hmm. years old. Yeah, well, Al's shacked up on the iconic Bark <laughs> Eagle, getting a closer look at the ship's inner working, its rich history. Mr. Roker, oh, what a night. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it was such an honor, guys, to be here. Uh, you can see the, cadet, the cadets and the crew uh, here of the Bark Eagle, this 239-foot, 95-foot, uh, uh, three masted schooner. It is unbelievable. But of course, the, the Bark Eagle is a legendary ship, not just uh, for the Coast Guard, but for America's armed forces. And it's where the, these cadets learn to be the future leaders of the sea. And, and as they say in the Coast Guard, this is where they learn to be always ready. Heave, oh! Heave, oh! This is America's tall ship. Built in 1936, the Eagle has sailed the world. Serving as a seagoing classroom for more than 100 trainees at a time. Every cadet who attends the Coast Guard Academy spends at least five weeks at sea literally learning the ropes. You learn more about yourself than you will ever learn anywhere else. On board, cadets put into practice what they've learned in the classroom, including specialized training in navigation, sailing, and engineering, all while learning to work as a team. How long, as a team. How long does it take you to get this all shined up? Super quick. Pretty oh. quick. This unique experience is meant to challenge young cadets. Admiral Linda Fagan knows these challenges all too well, once serving aboard the Eagle when she was at the academy. I wanted to serve in the Coast Guard. I, I knew I wanted to graduate and be an officer in Coast Guard. That was my plan. And somehow now, 41 years later, here I am. In June, she was named the new commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard, making Admiral Fagan the first woman to lead a branch of the U.S. military. You are the first uh, uh, female uh, head of one of our armed forces. Uh, what does that say? I still haven't completely internalized the significance of it. I understand it. Uh, we graduated the first class of women from the academy in 1980. Uh, I arrived at the academy in 81 and started, as I said, you know, this has uh, been, uh, been a journey that, uh, that I've been on. Heave ho! 
A journey that started with hoisting sails, just like this. The Eagle is a three-masted sailing ship with more than 20,000 square feet of sails and six miles of rigging. Basically, this is sweat equity that you uh -huh. see here. It is a beautiful day or there's not much wind. This will be pretty easy, but imagine a dark, stormy night oh my with a lot of wind and people up in the yard arms having to handle the sails. It's a little more uh, exciting then. And set sail under Captain Jessica Rossi Oaks. Well, welcome to the bridge. Thank you, Captain. Here on the stern, is, uh, Captain Rossi Oaks board. works with cadets navigating the ship. From steering... Here, what, three wheels? So, three, three wheels. I mean, this is, this is old school. It is. It is. It's not a joystick. To plotting the ship's route using paper charts. The cadets will, will plot this while we're underway to make sure that we know where our position is. I would think your weather briefings are pretty important. Very important. Every morning um, at 0730, we have someone that based, that gives us a weather report. So they'll stand in front of us. They'll be looking at the, the charts, you know, give us what the sea state is, where the high pressure systems, where the low pressure system. Because as a sailing ship, we need to find the wind. Right. With smooth sailing ahead, this class of cadets is ready to embark on their next mission. I'm excited for the organization. I'm excited for the country. We've got an incredible group of uh, talented people that are uh, stepping up to serve and ensure that uh, we, uh, we are safe as a nation. And, and joining me now is Captain Jessica Razi Oates. Uh, Captain, thank you so much for having us here. Uh, as, as the first female captain to lead this ship, what does it mean uh, for this team of cadets as, as you help shape them as they move forward in the Coast Guard? Well, I'm truly honored and, and, and blessed to be um, follow a long, distinguished line of commanding officers of Eagle. I think the Coast Guard is an incredible service. You know, we're on board here to help inspire those future leaders um, that are going to serve in the Coast Guard and, and really and to serve this nation. So what a credible experience. And, and in fact, I, I'm one of those that believe the Coast Guard doesn't get the credit that it deserves because you have so many missions uh, that, that, that have to be done to help protect our country. You're right. Uh, the Coast Guard really is everywhere. Anywhere you look out along the coast of the United States, I think the Coast Guard is there. And every piece of America, I think, feels that, that the Coast Guard's there. But, but you're right. Not a lot of folks necessarily know, know what we do, um, but uh, we're proud of what we do. We have an incredible uh, a group of uh, Coast Guard. In fact, it's it's been since 2017 since the the the, the, the eagle has made it into the new, the part of the port of New York. That's going to be kind of special this morning. It is. It is really special. So 2017, we're back in one of uh, America's greatest cities. We're anchored here off the Statue of Liberty, and it's just a special time for us. All right, Captain Rosie Oaks, thank you so much for having us. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Yeah, 
The City Concert Series on today is proudly presented to you by City. We are back with the man of the morning, Grammy-nominated country star Walker Hayes, known for smash hits, including Fancy Like. He took over a plaza this morning, and uh, he is not disappointed, folks. Walker's actually going to do one more song for us in just a moment. First, though, we wanted to bring him inside to catch up. Good to see you again. Good, see you Good morning. Hey, hey. Hanging. I can't even tell you how many times we've listened to all your songs in the car with my boys. I'm so upset I didn't bring them in today. Are you tired but of them yet? <laughs> no. I mean, we just sing along. It's just, That's it's so great. fun. So what was it like for you this morning to be out there, you know, here on the Today Show on the City Concert Stage with all everybody singing yeah, your song? Yeah, it's surreal. We had, we, one of my friends played me a funny video when we played, we played here five years ago. Mm -hmm. Nobody, you know, I'm standing outside <laughs> in the dark, you know, and I'm like, it's going to be a good show. Yeah. <laughs> and we were just getting started. And then, of course, that, that song, Fancy Like, it's changed our life. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. we, we, we can play shows like this and people just come from everywhere, yeah. you know? So that was, all, if you could be in my mind during the show, I was just thinking, man, life is wild. I was gonna say, it, it is a understatement to say it's been a breakthrough year, and yeah. it feels like it just hasn't stopped. You're gonna do your arena tour, you're gonna do this MLB uh, Field of Dreams oh, game, yeah. I saw. Have you had time to just stop and take a break with the family? No, no, I was just talking to my tour manager. We started when Fancy Like popped, and we've just been holding on for dear life. And you know, that the way my business goes, you just, you gotta make hay while the sun mm -hmm. is shining. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the, the family's out with us, and uh, we're showing them the world, and we're just holding tight to each other and just doing the best we can to keep up. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's been a crazy year. And we're getting, a, we're getting a tour here soon, right? Yeah, yeah. The Glad You're Here tour starts September 29th. First show, I believe, is at the Greek. In out LA. in L.A. Yeah, we'll see you out there. It's going to be awesome. I've only opened for people there. The family will be there. A lot of people come to the show, and if the family doesn't dance fancy like, they're, they're disappointed. <laughs> so everybody there will be there. But just to think, I'm, I'm nervous, but I'm pretty sure we can sell out arenas. So that's, yeah. well, that's wild, man. I mean, that's, that's insane, you know, coming from playing restaurants and uh, working at Costco man. and stuff. It's crazy to, to show up and just see lines of people who – who want to come and sing yeah. with us. Yeah. Seeing wild. your kids on stage doing the dance, you know, that went viral on TikTok. Yeah. Who, who decided to do the whole TikTok thing? Cause I, I mean, I didn't really, I don't know much about yeah, TikTok. Yeah, well, I didn't either. Or? No, my, so my manager, Marissa, she said, hey, there's a new, so, new social platform. Yeah. Okay, so at my age, I honestly was like, mm -hmm. dude, I just figured out Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I know. Uh, Look at my you guys. daughter was savvy. She knew, you know, she had heard about TikTok and she was oh, like, wow. um, hey, we'll do dances together mm -hmm. so that's what we did over COVID and this one we had no oh there's Lenny we had no <laughs> expectations um, with with fancy like we were just hanging mm -hmm. you know we, that's a way we bond we got to see what it's like when all 80 you were up on stage what's it like when all 80 you were on the tour bus together <laughs> oh man we're we're bumping into each other we got two dogs and they we, come too yeah and oh, we my. like them less and less every trip we take. <laughs> but uh man the bus is crazy and um, like I said every drawer you pull out, hit somebody, mm -hmm. and they're like, hey, you know, there's a lot of fights and there's food everywhere, but it is a chaos I've become accustomed to. I'm spoiled, and, and honestly, just telling you all the truth, when Fancy Like popped, about two months in, I said, I quit. I said, I'm done. Really? I said, I said hey, I think everybody will get paid for my for y'all's investment in mm -hmm. me. It's great. I didn't, because I was gone. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't see them for like two months. Oh. And so my management said, well, hey, let's, Let's see what it looks like with y'all getting a bus and the family coming. Game changer. I mean, I wow. could do it. I could do it forever, um, you know, as long as Laney's with me. Mm -hmm. And the kids will eventually, I'm sure they'll be like, hey, I want to go live my own life. Right. I don't know, maybe but, yeah. uh, I know, you know, I try to find ways. I'm like, hey, how much do you want to get paid? Right? <laughs> what, is, right. what does it take? One dance a night, you know, 100, 100 bucks? Yeah. I don't know. But I just, I don't know, you know, COVID spoiled me. You know, I was, I, I got to see what I was missing. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, um, and so that challenged me when we got back out. I was like, okay. I don't want to miss that anymore. You know, it's not worth it. Yeah. So now, now we're a family band, and, and they're is, all game for it. They, yeah, they, they are, and I will. I don't. I just don't want to lie to everybody. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, my wife and I, we we fight hard out there. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a. It's a. Sometimes she's like, 
do the kid thing. You know, she's like, you, you're out there working. I need some help with the kid. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. and I'm like, well, help me with work. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Why don't I'm you like, get you on stage? Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we have battles and then we, and then we apologize. That's how you get through them. Walker, that matters. Walker thank yeah. you. And oh. best of luck on the tour, yeah, by the way, as well. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos. The learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? You found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We are off on a summer getaway, and today we're taking you to south, to sunny Florida, and to a small island off the Gulf of Mexico. No high-rise hotels, no chains, no condos on Anna Maria Island, just turquoise waters and a simpler way of life. Oh, that's exactly what inspired one family to pack up everything they own and move there. Check it out. Last year, Ashley and Dino Patron took a family vacation that transformed their lives. As soon as we got off the plane, we both looked at each other and we're like, we're gonna, we're gonna move here. Originally from California, the parents of four fell in love with Anna Maria Island, Florida. It's just like seven miles of these beautiful, like white sandy beaches. Something truly magical. And the sunsets and the water. And then I think just the, the people here, it's so relaxed. It definitely feels like you, you go back in time. We drove by an old like motel and I was like, oh babe, what if we like looked for a motel or an inn and did that. Design is a huge passion for Ashley. She spearheaded four home renovations in California, tracking it all on our Instagram page, which has more than 700,000 followers. This I wanna turn into like a very cool hang place with tables in here and cool lights. All of that leading Ashley and Dino to their own book deal. Inspired by the small Florida town, the couple purchased a 1983 four-room motel while on their vacation. Yeah, it was called the Pirate's Den, so <laughs> it was very eclectic. Extremely eclectic. <laughs> we got really excited just about this, the potential we saw in this. And there's such a charm to it, and that's what I fell in love with. Yeah. I was like, I need, I need yeah. that. I need to do something yeah. there. When we purchased the inn, like we still had a house in California. We'll it was off. a real big like gamble, gamble. for us. It's like great to have an idea, but like, can we execute yeah. it? Rehabbing motels into stylish accommodations is a nationwide trend. In Saratoga Springs, New York, the 42-room Spa City Motor Lodge was once a 1950s roadside motel. But what was old has become new again. In Stonewall, Texas, the 1960s Stonewall Motor Lodge is now rebranded as a modern oasis. In Prescott, Arizona, the once distressed Prescott Motor Inn was transformed. And back on Anna Maria Island, Ashley and Dino transformed the old pirate's den into a beachside retreat they named Joa Inn, doing most of the work themselves. We bought the inn in April of 2021, worked on it like crazy, and had a grand opening October 1st. I picked a different room color for each of the four rooms based off of the shells that I found at the beach here. And did like a island feel, but an elevated island feel. Proximity to the beach has been great. We booked close to five months ago, I think, yeah. and yeah. kind of planned around that now. Anna Maria Island almost has this, this vibe too of like, oh, I've been coming there for 
20 years every summer or every winter or whatever. So it's, it's cool to see like we're getting to be part of that for some people now. And what keeps people coming back? The nearly perfect weather and the beautiful beaches. I'm always telling my customers, nothing good happens on land. You have to stay out here. Captain Kathy Fannin is a fourth generation fisherman in the area. She now gives ocean tours with her Cocker Spaniel first mate, Sailor. Oh, it's beautiful here. I come out here every day. I look around and go, I'm pretty lucky to be able to be here. We, our water is beautiful. We've got amazing stuff out here. And if you're looking for food, the sandbar has been an island staple since 1911, with toes in the sand dining and sweeping sunset views. Well, we were doing it for our birthdays. She had her birthday. Two weeks ago, yeah, we I had our, mine a week ago. Yeah, we treated ourselves to a trip. We actually have a house on the island, and we've been coming here for like the last 20, 25 years. Yeah. What you don't see is this massive sunburn on my back. <laughs> <laughs> to actually create a place where we could help people have experiences like that, I mean, it just gives me all the yeah. joie and joy yeah. <laughs> and life. I love that. Okay. I want to go. Yes. Would you like to go? I, in a minute, yeah. Okay, so if you're now thinking of a summer getaway to Anna Maria Island, you can find out more info at hodanjenna.com. Step away from the <laughs> It's worth it. It's so good. I know. You finished I, yours. I, it's done. You did it. I can't. Guys, come back next week. Jack Harlow's going to oh, be here for a concert. Great. All right, we'll see you then. Have a good weekend. Most of us think about Detroit, Motown, car manufacturing, even sports comes to mind. But when it comes to food, the folks here in the Motor City are all about one famous Frank, the Coney Dog. And no, we're not talking about Coney Island in New York. In Michigan, a Coney is both a diner to locals and a hot dog smothered in chili, topped with onions, and finished off with a <laughs> of mustard. Now there are dozens of Coney's in the Detroit metro area. Some bear the Coney Island name, others don't. But you'll always find some type of sausage, a bun, and a signature meat sauce on the menu. So what makes Michigan crazy for Coney's? Let's find out. The relationship be between Coney's and Detroit, it's a long relationship. It's a long love story. <laughs> the Coney is, is a part of Detroit. If you can drive and eat a Coney, it's not a Detroit-style Coney, in my opinion. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Welcome to Detroit. What do you say we travel back in time to the earliest days of the Coney? The folks at American Coney Island have been dishing up this local specialty for more than 100 years. In fact, this restaurant and the one next door, well, they've got a shared history. But American has been run by the same family for three generations. Founded by a Greek immigrant, this restaurant story is synonymous with the legendary hot dog of this city. What do you say we go meet the family? One to go plain, one fry. At American Coney Island, hot dogs aren't just a meal, they're memories. Grace Kiros is the third generation owner of this legendary spot. Grace. Al. Hi, good to see you again. It's been a long time. It has. We sat down to talk Coney traditions, turning points, and of course, toppings. 
People are very passionate about their Coney Island hot dog. Yes, they are. Why? Because it holds a nostalgia and a tradition to them. We see daily generations of people coming in here. Remember grandpa bringing them, my mom brought me. It, it's part of their growing up, it's part of their life. 30 years ago, Grace took over the restaurant reins from her dad, Chuck Kiros. Chuck inheriting the business from his father, founder Constantine Kiros, AKA Gust. Your place, this place on this corner has been here for 105 years. What is it like being really part of the fabric of, of an iconic city like Detroit? Yeah, it's surreal. I mean, I think back to my grandfather and my dad and the things they saw here from, from riots to Tigers winning the World Series when they were good. Such a deep history and, and proud. Mm -hmm. I love this city. The Coney craze in Detroit is really a legacy of the Kiros family. Historian Joe Grimm co-writing the book on Coney's in the Motor City. The Kiroses came to Detroit from Dara in Greece, where this was a sheep herding town, and they needed to find work. And they really struck gold, as in the color of mustard, when they started making these Coney Island hot dogs. In the late 1800s, Greece was facing a massive economic crisis setting off a wave of global migration. By 1920, it's estimated that over 400,000 Greeks immigrated to the United States seeking new opportunities. Like most European immigrants of the era, they passed through New York before moving on to other parts of the country. They entered, most of them, through Ellis Island, which is near Coney Island. They saw people on Coney Island and in New York eating hot dogs and said, ah, we're gonna go into the hot dog business, but we're gonna top it with something Greek now, the true origins, like who invented the Coney dog, lost to history. It just sort of happened in a lot of places in about the same time, mostly by Greek immigrants. Gust and his brother, Bill Kuros, opening one of Detroit's first Coney shops in the early 1900s. A family rift caused the brothers to split, leading to side-by-side -side Coney operations and a long-lasting restaurant rivalry. Detroiters swearing allegiance to American or Lafayette, but only American is still owned by the Kiros family today. We figure well more than 100 Coney Islands can trace their lineage directly to that flat top grill. Each Coney spot in the Detroit area and throughout Michigan has its own history, from national to Kirby's to Nicky D's, from Berkeley Coney Island to L. George's to Leo's and more. But all of the city's Coney's have a similar foundation, starting with a steamed bun. You add a beef and pork hot dog. Then it's covered with a chili sauce. And the chili sauce is where Coney owners can improvise and innovate. And then on top of that, it's going to be a yellow salad mustard and diced onions and never any ketchup. If you put ketchup on a Coney dog, you might get thrown out of the restaurant. Definitely a controversial condiment here. Definitely no ketchup. When I see ketchup behind, is we that... sell French fries. When customers come to the carryout and want, you know, I'll have a coney with everything. Every once in a while, you get, okay, I want ketchup on mine too. We don't do it. We refuse to put the ketchup on the hot dog. And we've had people who got a little upset with us. I'm like, dude, I'm not putting ketchup on the hot dog. Your your grandfather immigrates here from from, from Greece. Greece. Why hot dogs? It was something that he had seen when he landed at Ellis Island in New York. He saw, you know, the amusement park. You gotta remember, he was a young man, came over with no money, I mean, borrowed a pair of shoes. He heard the automotive business was hiring in Detroit, made his way to Detroit, thinking they'll hire me even though I don't know to read or write. They didn't. On this little corner right here where we are now, he started a little push cart. You know, we're Greek, right? We know food. So grandpa remembered the hot dogs, made a Greek chili sauce. Our chili's a little unique. You hear about a Coney Island hot dog. You yes. think about Nathan's in New York City. But here's the difference. I'm going to stop you. OK. A Coney Island in New York is an amusement park right. that sells hot dogs. In Detroit, a Coney Island is the actual, it's the hot dog with the chili, mustard, onions on it. That's the difference. And I got a lot of heated arguments people about that. Really? In Detroit, it is the actual thing you're eating, thanks to my grandpa, because he named it American Coney Island. He was so grateful he was in America and all the opportunities were given to him. Grace now in charge of carrying on the family legacy. 
It's obviously been passed from generation to yes. generation here. But each time you lose a member of the generation, it, it's got to be tough. You just lost your dad. Yes. Uh, not too long ago. Yeah, six months ago. When you come in, do you feel him here? I do. I, I, yes, I do. And I feel a sense of pride. I miss him a lot, obviously. But I, I just feel his presence. I feel everything he, he taught me. My grandpa did his thing. Then once my dad stepped in and took over, he took it to the next level. Then I took it to a whole nother level, with my brother self included. Grace's brother, Chris Soderopoulos, helps run the business today. There's an American outpost at the Detroit Zoo, plus a new location in Las Vegas. They're also shipping Coney kits all across the country. You get everybody yeah. from all walks of life, exactly. every demographic, every racial component, you nailed everybody it, comes here. Yes. The American Coney is the great equalizer. It, that's, I love the way you put it that way, Al. Exactly. We love the, our customers. I mean, our customers are like family. It's no joke. This is who made us. So we treat you like family. We don't know any different. Coming up, I learned how to make the quintessential cone. One up! Right there, nice shot. Hey. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? You found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. At American Coney Island, the oldest family-run Coney spot in Detroit, they keep things traditional. But you know, as I look at your menu, and I look at the pictures, they're uh, vi vintage, let's That's say. It doesn't look like you have strayed that much from the original menu. We haven't. I, I won't. Why add to it when it's working? You know what else is working? Me. I got behind the grill with Grace to prep the perfect plate of Coney's. This is the proprietary hot dog. If you notice the natural casing, yes, it's a 90% beef, 10% pork with a lambskin casing. That's that, like three meats in one. You exactly. Got, uh, pork, beef, and a and that's lamb. That's right. And that's what makes it pop. Like when you bite into it, oh, it snaps snap. like a party in your mouth. Yes. yes. That detail kept popping up everywhere we went. It's a warm bun. It's the, it's the snap of the hot dog. When you bite it, you hear that pop. You can tell it's a natural casing because when you bite it, it snaps back at you. The steamer bun. Ah. And That's they, what we were taught. They're in a oh, steamer. You know, there's steamer. just enough steam in mm -hmm. here. So you're going to pull out the bun. Right. Look, look for the cut. Yep. Just so open it up a little. Grab your plate. Yes. All right. So we're going to grab one. Right. Come over here. Do you want to top it or do you want to... I want to watch the top. Okay. Give it a little mix. Little, this is that... Little zhuzh. Greek fiat. That's right. It gets a little messy. Some chili. Add a little more. You know, mm -hmm. be cheap with the chili. Greek spices. Yes. That's the magic. The secret spice blend? Well, it's secret. But the chili is made with ground beef. The tangy mustard. Tangy. Just a little lime, nothing nothing more. You take some onions, sprinkle them across, and there you go. Boom. Okay. 105 years. 105 years of magic. magic. My turn. Get a plate. I need one up, which means I one. need one for a customer. One for Everything a customer. Everything on it. Chili, mustard, onions. Get the split. Open it up a little more, Al. Little All more. right, that's not too bad. Okay. <laughs> Boom. 
All right, now keep, I come keep over here. Keep the bun open because you want oh, the chili oh, to go in. You want in the chili there. to go yeah, in. Yeah, you want the chili. You want it. Yeah. I want that you chili. Chintz out on Get that chili. Little, don't chintz on the chili. Turn your dish a little so it's easier oh, for you to pour over there. All right. There. Oh, that really it does have a creamy See, consistency. See, it's really creamy. Right. Exactly. And mustard. There you go. Ooh, that's heavy mustard. Did they order heavy mustard? Um, no, they didn't. <laughs> I, I'm making this for myself. <laughs> exactly. There you go. All right. One up. Ready. There, yeah, nice shot. Yeah. Awesome. Woo. Good job, Al. Hey, now. Life-changing experience. Mm. It's magic in your mouth. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Who made Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time? When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Every great Coney needs a great bun, but not just any bun will do. A few miles from downtown Detroit is another family-run institution that's keeping the Coney tradition alive. What started as a small baking business is now one of the state's biggest suppliers of Coney buns. And that bun is the Coney Island Steamer. That's a good bun. The Coney Island Steamer is a six inch hot dog bun. At Metropolitan Baking Company, they like big buns and they cannot lie. The Coney Island Steamer Bun is our flagship item on the bun and roll line. Not to mention, they claim to have buns of steel. These buns sit in a steam table. The product's formulated for that steam table. That bun is going to sit there and it's not going to fall apart on you when you load it with all those condiments. In Michigan, Coney dogs aren't just a tasty meal. They're big business. The Coney business gave rise to supplier industries, just as the auto industry did. So we need to have a major bun maker here. The big maker nowadays is Metropolitan Bakery, and they bake these Coney dog buns with the sponge dough method. For three generations, the Cordes family, who also traced their roots back to Greece, has risen to the occasion selling specialty breads. Metropolitan Baking Company was founded by my grandfather in 1945. In the beginning, Metropolitan only sold simple loads. Today, they produce dozens of items for grocery stores, high-end restaurants, and of course, Coney Diners. And while their products have changed over the years, a few names have truly stood the test of time. He was George James Cordes, uh, namesake, and my father is James George Cordes, and I'm George James Cordes. My father, and just like me, it was, it was, was bred in the business. George credits his father for the company's massive expansion in the mid-80s. This summer, we're going to be producing millions of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. This abundance, pun intended, 
is all thanks to automation. Automation is, is really what transformed this company. We went from packaging maybe 10, 15 loaves of bread a minute to 140 loaves a minute. In 2001, after years of recipe testing, the signature steamer bun was added to the product line. It is a hot dog bun that we formulated to be used at the Coney Island restaurants um, in Metro Detroit specifically. This bun that we produce is in roughly 95% of all Coney Island restaurants. And it takes a lot of dough to make all those buns. So what we're doing right now, this is where it all begins. This is the mixing room, and we're about to create a 1,600 pound dough batch of hot dog buns. Major ingredients are gonna be flour is 65%, you know, then you've got your yeast, you've got your sugar, you've got your oil, you know, and a bunch of, bunch of proprietary ingredients. Any minute. That's um, roughly 1,200 packages of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. There you go, you did it. <laughs> that makes over 14,000 buns. After mixing, the dough gets cut into bun-sized portions. You're looking at three-foot sheets that were just guillotined, and now they're going into a smaller divider to be put into roughly uh, 1.25 ounce dough balls. Next up, time to proof. After 60 minutes, the dough has risen. And after about 10 minutes bake time, we're gonna have a fully baked hot dog bun that's prepared to cool. The buns are almost ready. The product's sliced, you know, after the cooling conveyor, and then it's paddled on top of each other to create a 12 pack, a dozen buns. The baskets are headed down to logistics and ready to be set up for routes. Then it's off to stores in Michigan's finest Coney restaurants, including American Coney Island. While the factory may have a lot of machinery, George has always been hands-on. So I worked here every summer throughout high school and throughout college, almost every position. And you really learn what hard work is as a kid to work in a bread factory you know, when it's 110 degrees out. When Grandpa George started the company, he had fewer than 10 employees. Today, they've got almost 100. When they say employees, family, family employees, that's for John. He's literally family. John Grabowski has worked with all three generations of the Cordes family. At 12 years old, he took a summer job washing buckets at Metropolitan. Today, he's the plant's lead engineer. It's like family. When you come to this business, everybody that's here, they feel like family to me. Everybody says hello to each other. It's a good camaraderie. Everybody likes each other. It's more than just bread and butter for the employees. It's really nice being run by a family on business. It, you can come to work and feel like you're at home. It's like a second family to me. We all work together, we, you know, we get down in the dirt, you know, we exchange uh, all kinds of work habits and we learn from each other and we do the best we can. The longtime employees are proud, keeping Detroit's Coney tradition going strong. We all grew up eating Coney's, right? Homerica Park, you know, baseball games as a kid with mom and dad and the grandparents, family time. Coney dogs go that's a part of pretty much everybody's childhood. It's a joy to be a part of that heritage. Today, Metropolitan's running six days a week, 20 hours a day. The amount of product that we're sending out each day, from the first dough that's kicking out around 1.30 in the morning till the final package at 10 at night, I feel constant pride. As for the future, George's kids seem to have inherited his love for the bakery. My daughters, Cecile and Sloan, I, I bring them almost every Saturday. They actually tell me that they enjoy it more than Disney World. And this is their favorite place on earth, just like what it was for me as a kid that age. It's that joy and a family legacy that George hopes will carry on for many years to come. I absolutely love what we're doing here. I love our history. I never want to be that third generation cliche. You know, I want to continue the growth with my kids, or my kids' kids, have them look back, family members, and say, wow, that's incredible. Look at what you've done. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now.
who meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> the day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Chili, mustard, onion. What happens if you reverse it? <laughs> oh, you're out. You're out. You're out. You're out. <laughs> Minutes from downtown is Detroit's Brush Park neighborhood. Folks here are flocking to enjoy the good vibes at this cool Coney spot. CMO may be relatively new to the game, but loyal fans can't get enough of their chili, mustard, and onions. CMO, get it? But unlike most diners in town, here, the Coney, the sauce, and everything else on the menu is powered by plants. My name is Pete Lacombe. I'm the owner of Chili Mustard Onions in Detroit, Michigan. You could say opening a vegan Coney spot in the Coney capital takes guts and grit. And that's exactly what this family's made of. I don't follow any rules. I follow the important ones, but I don't do what everybody else does. Pete and his wife, Shelly, along with their daughter, Darla, launching CMO in 2018. It's the first and only all vegan Coney spot in Detroit. I would say my wife gave me the biggest kick in the butt to go vegan, and we did. I had a vision that we were gonna open a vegan Coney Island, and I told Pete that, and he told me I was out of my mind. Pete and Shelly have enjoyed many a traditional Coney as lifelong Detroit residents. When Shelly and I got married, she used to tell me all the time that I was gonna open a restaurant, and it was gonna be a vegan restaurant, and I said, yeah, I'm not vegan. So I asked her why she thought I was going to open a vegan restaurant. She said, you could never hurt an animal or sell animals. And I went, ah, oh, you're so right. Now, the family's been vegan for over 10 years. It not only saved my life going vegan and saved my life by doing something I love, um, I got to do something I love every single day with the people I love. Before entering the restaurant business, Pete worked in the auto industry, just like his dad and his granddad. When I was in automotive design, I ate horribly. I smoked cigarettes, I drank a lot. It was just kind of the norm in that field. That was really in my blood, but it wasn't in my soul. Cooking was in my soul. Pete's true passion coming from spending time with family in the kitchen. So we lived really close to my grandparents and what was in my soul was food. I cooked with my grandmas all the time. My grandma, my mom's mom, really should have opened a restaurant. And um, I feel like I'm living that dream through her. That dream now possible with the next generation. So Darla's our manager and she takes care of the customers so well. And seeing the woman that she has become, we're so proud of her. My wife and I, we've been through so much with partners in crime, partners in life, partners in love. And partners in creating a home away from home for every customer. I created CMO, the interior to reflect like my basement or my living room where you could come over and eat at my house. Everybody's welcome in my home. Every day, somebody wants to go tell him how fabulous this place is and how blown away they are with this food. Since it first opened, CMO has been delighting vegans and non-vegans alike with their take on hot dogs smothered in chili. 
The amount of love and emotion that is put into the food and every bite, you can tell that. I've never had vegan food. But it was really, really good. This just tasted so similar to the wood as a, a regular Coney Island. You know, it's hard to come by something that's like so close to like a childhood favorite. Of course, I had to see if this Coney truly lived up to the hype. Hey, Al. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome to my kitchen. Well, this is really cool. We've heard all about this. When you're used to something that is meat. Yeah. You know, getting them to try something that doesn't quite fit what they think it's supposed to be. For me, I let my food speak. If I put something out there on a plate that is incredible, happens to be vegan, that, that changes minds and hearts and, you know, it's incredible. I see your, your, your wife and your daughter standing out there. Are they taste testers? Oh, <laughs> my wife for sure, yes. That's love. It is, oh, it's love. <laughs> And we'll be married 30 years this year. Congratulations. So. Thank you. Let's make some vegan magic. Let's do that. The the hot dog, what kind of protein is this? It's a pea and soy protein. And this is your chili. What's yes. The, now, what's the protein in here? This is chili? Beyond uh, Crumble, uh -huh. a plain Beyond Crumble. A lot of Coney places are hush-hush about their chili, but Pete was willing to dish a little. How do you make your chili? I use a blend of spices, salt, pepper, garlic, onion, and a few other things that are top secret. <laughs> We're gonna throw that in our water. Okay. That's the hero right there. Right there. The spice is the hero. The chili's brought to a boil, then thickened with potato starch. It was time to try my first vegan coney. That's a healthy ladle. It is. I usually do a little more than that. Wow. So, yeah. Do a lot of onions. Here they are. Let's give that a shot. That's really good. Especially the chili. Thank you. How long did you have to work on the chili recipe? You know, I, I hit it right on the head when we first went vegan, mm -hmm. and then I didn't write it down. <laughs> <laughs> so then it took me about a year after that to really nail it down. But even with a winning recipe, times have been tough for CMO. What was the pandemic like for you guys? It hit us extremely hard, and we're still struggling and fighting, and you know, there's no quit in us. But it's been tough, yeah. How's the future look for you? I really don't know. We're, we're trying, we're working every day, but I, I don't know what the future holds. I really don't. If it's based on the taste of that, your future's bright, my friend. Thank you so much. That I is good. It. Thanks so wow. much. Wow. The history behind Detroit's Coney Dog is truly an all-American tale, from the Greek immigrants who borrowed the name to a mashup of traditional flavors with a boardwalk staple. And now, there's a whole generation of locals who are ensuring that this regional hot dog is here to stay. Good morning, breaking overnight, ready to deal. The U.S. and Russia now set to discuss a prisoner swap after WNBA star Brittany Griner is sentenced to nine years in a Russian prison. Just ahead, the outrage from fans and fellow players overnight and